And we're live. Uh, another edition of the Johnny and Gene Show. I'm Felix Levine to my right. We got Gene, John, Anthony, Bobby, and Pauly as our guests today. Um, first time we've ever had two bosses on the show in studio. So this is uh, new for us. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you. And uh, before we get into it, I just want to remind uh, the people listening out there to make sure that they subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to our brand new Patreon channel. That's where we have all of our bonus content. Everything goes goes and gets posted there early. So make sure you check it out. The link is in the, the video, uh, the description of the video. Um, gentlemen, thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, I think it only do you justice to, to let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, we'll start with with Anthony over here. Uh, a little bit about who you are for the people out there that aren't familiar with you. Um, I'm uh, Anthony from Springfield, Mass. I was uh, raised there my whole life and uh, pretty much got in a life of crime at a young age and uh, graduated uh, into getting into organized crime, bigger parts of it, and then eventually became the boss of my area, uh, Connecticut and Mass, for the uh, Genovese family. Bobby? Hi, I'm Bobby Luisi. I'm from Boston. Look into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was a boss up in Boston. Um, I was a cop on the Philadelphia family, but I was born and raised in uh, Boston in the North End in the Italian section. I grew up with gangsters my whole life. I was groomed by them. I was a proposed guy in the Patriarca family, and I had a fallen out with them in the 90s. We had a war up there. You know, a lot of people were getting killed up there at the time, and I ended up hooking up with the Philadelphia family. And I went down to Philly, I became a copper in their family, and I straightened my crew out in Boston. But everybody in Boston were all Boston guys, no Philly guys. Um, I hooked up with Jory Molino and Georgia Borghese in Philadelphia. Good guys, you know. And I was running everything up in Boston in the 90s. And I got picked up in 99. And since then, I became a Christian and a pastor and wrote a few books. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now. And pretty much that's that's my story. Beautiful. And Paul, just for... Uh, I'm Paul Tanzo, uh, once convicted murderer, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, Luisi family loyalist. Yep. And last, basically, of the um, loyal soldiers. Yeah. Bobby. Yeah. So I guess I'll start off. I mean... John, Gene, you know, how, when did you guys first kind of connect or know of each other, hear about each other, um, I guess from the past life and also today? I'll let you take it away, John. Uh, well, me and Anthony know each other from uh, the uh, 90s, actually. So we had uh, communication through mutual friends the whole way through and stayed in touch with each other. With Bobby, uh, we have also had mutual friends. We didn't have direct contact in, in street business, but we had mutual friends sending uh, different uh, messages and different things that went on mm -hmm. over the years uh, through streets, through crime. Now, for, for you, Anthony and Bobby, I mean, growing up, did you guys know uh, that this was the life that you were going to go? I mean, was it, um, you know, inevitable that you would one day end up wor working in organized crime? I mean, for me, I was, uh, we always grew up with a mafia presence in our area. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, people don't understand that what the mafia was. It was a... Uh, second form of government it was um mm -hmm. bigger than life if if you told us and i'm sure in your area we growing up they we could meet the uh president or a uh, senator or you know a big time business owner or a, or a mafia boss we would pick the mafia boss um it was just part of our life growing up mafia was spoken all of our households and it was something that you know, it was mysterious. The, our family would be like, oh, I don't want you to be like them, but they would respect them. So it was kind of like it drew you to them. And then once you get old, you know, you started getting older, you start realizing, you see them uh, driving nice cars, uh, dress nice, getting respect. So it's kind of, you know, it draws you in. It's kind of like you want to be part of this mysterious secret society. You know, you want to know more about it. And then I guess growing up, you just, you grow up, you're, we're wild, we're wise guys, you know, you, you know, um, just wild kids growing up. So that kind of gravitates towards the uh, mafia life. And they look for that. They, they look for, you know, young kids that are, you know, that are wild and like trouble. And, um, you know, you, we hung around a little gang of us and we uh, went out and 
kind of like terrorized the city as, as young kids, you know, always fighting different uh, yeah. groups as young kids. And, you know, they yeah, look... all the kids, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they look at us and they see, uh, you know, these kids are, you know, and they kind of like, uh, they start grooming us towards that type of life. And in my case, my family had a, uh, a successful uh, produce business. So it was kind of like uh, I could have went that route, which... And or the streets. And I chose the streets because... You know, my family was, my father was a hardworking guy, never involved in any of the uh, organized crime rackets. And uh, he worked hard. And it was a business that he, uh, he worked hard and he did it. And it was something like, not for me. And, uh, and I remember just, uh, you know, just starting hitting the streets around 15, selling some drugs, you know. And making money and I just kind of that's when I hit the streets and I liked it I loved the action I loved uh, hustling every day making money um, you know and I just that was just it was just in me I loved it and then it graduate obviously you start hanging around you start being on record with uh, the wise guys come up and uh, you know I see a talent in you and they want you to put you on record with them meaning they want you uh, with them and uh, you start earning with them and start, you know, doing things with them, violence, giving guys um, beating when it comes to it, you know, to, you know, to that. And um, you start earning and then it keeps getting further along until they want you to shoot someone. Um, and then eventually they propose you to be a member and then you end up getting made into the family and you're uh, in the mafia. Now, this idea of grooming, um, like you, I think you, you said um, and you guys have probably all experienced it at some point. Mm-hmm. What is it like to be kind of groomed into the mafia as a young kid? Well, I don't believe that it's something that uh, it, it happens over a course of time. And I'll give you for myself, for instance. My father was a gangster. So I grew up with gangsters since I was a young kid. 11 years old, I used to work for the Injulo family in Boston. I used to do the dime machines on a Saturday, the vendor machines. You know, I was always around it. I was always around wise guys, big guys, capos, and you know, they tell you when to talk, when not to talk. You start learning right away. You you have to observe. That's the old school that I come from, because I came up with old timers, which is a lot different than some young guys that came up. And Anthony and Johnny had that opportunity too. And from what I seen from the life, you know, I was 16, 17, and I was doing carpentry after school, and I loved it. And that's what I wanted to do. So I started pulling away myself from them. You know, they had us do a few things. I did a few things for them. I'm not going to say what. Those guys are still around. You know, but uh, eventually I didn't want to be a gangster. I didn't want nothing to do with it. And I got into development. I had a construction company at 20 years old, two builders license. And I was happy and content, you know. And then the late 80s, uh, the market crashed. Down the Cape and Martha's Vineyard. It was building houses down there. Right. Yeah. I don't know the vineyard. Beautiful area. Yeah, 1,500 homes down there. Making money. The one day I got up, I didn't have a job. Two kids, go back to Boston. The only other thing I knew to do was put a gun on. So around 1990, I got back into it. And there was a war that broke up. So I had to slide into that, you know. It's sad in this life because, you know, it's glorified. It's something to grow up with these guys. The money they had, the cars, the the houses. I mean, you're impressed by it. But being a young kid watching it, I see when it was really about then. You understand? So I wasn't too crazy about it. But when I came back and I had no money and I had to get back on my feet, I put the gun on my back and I went out, you know, and I just started doing what I had to do. And that's what happens in our life. And luckily, like I said, I was around them, kind of groomed when I was younger. If that's what they were doing with me, you know, and uh, you learn, that's part of it. You know, you have to be groomed. And for you two, I mean, did you guys have a, a <coughs> grooming process as, as well, if you will? Same thing as him. I grew up around it my whole life. I was born into it pretty much, you know, so it's around yep. you your whole life. You know, I yep. picked up where they left off pretty much, you know. I took people's places, basically. I was doing the things I was doing. You well, know? What, what do the higher ups tell you? I mean, they teach you the rules, basically, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing at first. I was breaking rules like crazy. I was sticking up social clubs. I almost got killed three times. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, <I> did <laughs> you know so yeah. I was learning, you know, as I go. I was like, yeah. well, you can't do this. You're not supposed to do that. I was, so it was a learning process for me, yeah. you know. Thank God that I had family and people around it because I don't think I would have made it that far because I was doing, uh, you know, I was breaking a lot of rules. So you got to learn, you know. 
And that's what I did. I learned from the old old timers, like he said. Yeah. And for you, John? Well, I, I had guys that went back, like, I learned from a guy that's 86 years old right now. Yeah. You know, so I learned from old, old school yeah. guys where yeah. they only believed in you make you make a mistake and you pay with your life. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. those are the guys I learned from, you know? Yeah. It's not like a lot of people today watch The Godfather. They want uh, to be yeah, this, right. Yeah. That's, That's not it. Yeah. You know. You know. For for you, John, was it like that? Was there some a big mentor, I guess, if you will? Yeah, I mean, you know, my father grew up in the Lower East Side, so it was a hub of gangsters, Vito Genovese and those guys, and he uh, became very good friends with uh, Little Al, Lucchese guys. So actually, he's got a life sentence now. Uh, killer, uh, good-looking Jack. These are Lucchese guys in Jersey, and then. On the New York side, and Jersey also, Blackie, uh, Luciano. So these are famous guys in the mob world yeah. that, uh, since I'm five years old. And then yeah. I was around his uncle, Fat Andy Ruggiano, with Murder, Inc. So these are the guys that, you know, when you when most kids are going to preschool and kindergarten, that that's, I guess, all of us in the same situation. That's kind of our kindergarten. We just learn the way of the street uh, from proper gangsters, serious gangsters. And, you know, you learn... The, you know, the rules, the code, and, and the life itself. And as you're getting older, you develop and you're stepping right into a pair of shoes that fit perfectly because obviously you're groomed for it. Yep. Is that, was that the same for you, Polly, as well? I was <coughs> so young, when, like eight years old, when I started hanging yeah, with, with you the family and, and the father family. and everything. I yep. grew up around his father since I was eight. And yeah. Sounds naive, but I was so young. Yeah, my I, father I didn't was think I was a criminal. Yeah. I thought I was just doing something good for one of my friend's fathers. You know, go throw a hammer through a window. Yeah. On. We're going to be selling, <laughs> you know, we're going to be selling firecrackers out of the playground. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so you just start picking up these little odd jobs. And right. everybody else is going and killed himself for money. And meanwhile, I'm sitting in a playground, suntanning all day long and making more than my father. Than yeah. He, Selling firecrackers. I'm like, oh, can I take some home? They're like, oh, yeah, take home a bag every night if you want. And, uh, He's been corrupt since he was eight years old, so don't. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we all Bob, have. Yeah. Bob, you, uh, you said something interesting earlier about, um, you know, after the, the market crashed and yeah. you didn't have a job. Yeah. Uh, did you ever think twice about going back into it? No. No, I didn't. I grew up in it. I had the name already from my father, yeah. you know, so it was easy for me to slide in there. I had the respect from all the main guys there. How's that work, though, when you kind of get back into it? Like, who are you talking to? What are the conversations like? Well, basically, we're our own men. Do you understand? I didn't ask permission from anybody. I did hook up with who I had to hook up with. I mean, that's respect. That's how we grew up. You know, always someone over us, you know, but I just went out and did what I had to do. I wanted to earn. I had card clubs. We were selling drugs. We were doing it, extorting. Loan shock and had a big loan shock business. The best. I built up right away. You know, it didn't take me long. I hit a million and boom, I was living up the streets with the money. You right. got to remember they're Boston guys. And, yeah. and, and not because they're sitting here. Yeah. But any joint you go to, anybody is from any joint, they know the Boston guys are, are gritty. They fight. Yeah. And they're just, it's in their blood to be tough, honestly. More so than any other area I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Where these guys happen to grow up. There's a lot of tough guys that we talked about earlier. Yep. Streety kids, uh, the Shays, and uh, well, you know, especially the Irish guys. Yeah, the Irish, yep. yeah, they fight. Man. Great they, people. They're, they're, they're tough guys. Yeah. Man. They're, a lot of my crew was Irish. Yeah, yeah. You know, because know. we got to we got to work together, yeah. John. Yeah. You know, the Shea brothers are good people. Yeah. Now you I know? wanted to, Anthony. What was your mentor coming up? Who did you? Uh... Who schooled you on the on the gangster life, basically? It, you know, it wasn't really school, but the guy I looked up to and that was, I was around at first was um, Bruno. Okay. Yeah. So he was like, you know, he's the one that showed you the ropes. Cause you not really, he way, showed you know me the ropes, but yeah. he was someone I looked up to. And uh, I mean, I think it's in you where it's not in you. When right. you start hitting the streets, you figure it out quick. And um, if it's drugs, I mean, you know, you start selling drugs and you figure out how the game works. Same thing with running numbers. Sports gambling, loan sharking. Is that why we sold so much drugs, me and you? Yeah, a lot of <laughs> marijuana. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I think it wasn't like he, you know, you just know what the crimes are and you get involved and, uh, you know, well, you take pointers from him. And like, like, a lot of people don't know you like I know you. You, you have one of the most violent crews for the Genovese family. Yeah. A lot of guys don't know that. Yeah, we they had know a the vicious crew. The Genovese family in New York ain't really um, violent. Yeah. But you, were, you had a really, really violent crew. Yeah, we had a violent crew. Uh, we actually did a hit. A couple of things down in beatings and uh um you know shootings and uh and they had a lot more in plan but we we kept getting arrested at the time so right. it was always uh but they were they liked us coming down there right you were handling a lot of the work for them right yeah yeah we especially in our area right 
Will you guys talk about the, I guess, talking about the differences with the Boston Crews, the biggest difference between New York mob and Boston mob, similarities, differences, um, I guess, because you guys all have different angles. For let, let, let me tell you Same what rules. people don't Come understand. On. Yeah, People don't understand is the reach we have, the, just the way we're friendly now. We have the ability, if Bobby had a situation anywhere in New York, he'd make a phone call and say, John, do me a, f a favor, buddy. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, what, you know, find this guy for me, do me a favor, and then whatever needed to be taken care of. It's that simple. He doesn't got to get in his car. He doesn't have to drive down here. He doesn't have to do anything. <coughs> and it's vice versa for Anthony or any of us. You know, it's very easy yeah. to reach from any city, state. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. To this day, we're yeah. all very friendly. So, yeah. you know. It happens like that because you could have a problem... Like, for instance, my cousin was hit by somebody in New Rochelle. This idiot decided to run to a banana guy in yep. New Rochelle. Yeah. They says, yeah, yeah, we'll help you. They set him up for me. It's that simple. And he that's, comes to me yeah, and we beat the piss out of him. Yeah. That, that's just, that's well, how it that's works. Yeah, we got you. We'll help you. And you. Yeah, we got the jerk off to hit your cousin. Oh, he's going to yeah. meet you here. All right, great. And that's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but a big thing for us, like you were saying, New York and Mass, uh, a lot of problems that they had, and you know they'll probably agree, is uh, they had five families there. So yeah. I mean, there were they had like you know, never mind your own crew and your own family is bad enough. But then when you're fighting for the same uh, spots and the same people, and they're part of the Lucchese's or the Gambinos or the Genovese, you got more uh, competition. So I mean, you got to really be. Uh, qualified in that life to get ahead because you got so many guys in New York, so many different families, so many made guys, so many associates. Now, when you come to Mass, you really only have one family, which is the Patriarchas in Boston and our area, which is Central Mass and Western Mass all the way into Albany. And we shared kind of with the Patriarchas, Connecticut, but when they got arrested in the 90s, we pretty much took that whole area over. Bobby, with his crew that he came up, he started coming back into the area. But we were friends, so we yep. would have got along great. We would have worked hand yeah, we in hand. Together a lot, but there was there was no competition amongst us. Yeah. So it was like we, everything we made. It just it, it it was a funnel that was coming into one family. Yep. So it was just a lot more money, and with no competition. And if somebody did come in another family, we never had any beefs with anybody because we controlled everything. And I think that's a big part of it, you know, that we got lucky that there wasn't uh, other families to fight with and wars going on and who's fighting over spots and bars and who's this guy with. And um, like I said, when Bobby came up, uh, he kind of like was doing that, but we got along great, so it didn't affect anything. Now, will you talk for people out there who have no idea, how do you guys kind of progress uh, into the higher ups to become, you know, bosses and take over more control and have higher status? Um, we talk about your process. So for me, um, you know, it's still like I know today they don't have to kill anybody to get made. Um, in my case, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how you get your initial button. You want to call it or straightened out. Yep. Um, so once you get your straightened out in my area, be like I said, there's uh, we're the Genovese family. So um, I had the biggest crew, the most violent crew, all the big top money earners. And uh, there was just uh what was going to happen, what was happening was um, the boss in my area was going to be, was Bruno. <coughs> Al Bruno was the boss of Connecticut and Mass of the for the Genovese family. But he's a he's a boss. And um, he was getting, uh, he, he was getting stripped of his rank. And when I got, when I got made in um, August of 2003, I was taking over his position as boss of our area, which I did. I took over the area as a boss. And Bruno was still alive. And then, um, and Bruno was just taken down and, and put in as a soldier. A um, couple of months after I got straightened out, a paperwork surfaced with uh, Bruno cooperating with the uh, FBI. Um, a 302, they call it. He, uh, he gave information to an FBI agent. And um, it was about if another made guy w was a, actually a made guy. And that paper circulated back to the um the made guy and uh you know a month later bruno got killed we had a you know we got an order to kill bruno and um but at that point i i was already the uh, boss of connecticut and mass and i continued to stay boss up until for the next uh seven years how many people were in your crew i would say i mean we probably hundreds of people were in my crew but my immediate crew i mean 
um, they're all different types. When you talk about crew earners, I had okay. how many you know, soldiers you had on you? Uh, actual made guys, I would say a dozen, mm. and um, and they had associates. And then, and, and but crews. you know, it was like in in the crew itself, it's like you know, you call like earners. They're in your crew. They're an associate, but they're in your crew. And you got guys that are capable of murder. They're in your crew. Right. Um, certain, you know, don't have to be made, but you're still part you of your crew. Like a business. Two of my with, friends with were yeah. that were in my crew weren't even Italian, and you know they couldn't get made, but um, they were a big part of my crew. And do you, uh, do you? I mean, how does the like giving orders or get or you know delegating different things work? You don't ever do you have uh, personal contact every time? Do you have people you tell one person something else and they tell? The rest of the soldiers. I mean, how does it work for like a, a casual person who doesn't understand the way uh, the, the mafia works in terms well, of that? Well, I mean, on the way out, he might ask me to kill you. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a lot of buffers, especially with me. I mean, I think the smart yeah. guys what they do is they insulate themselves, yeah. and uh, you know, like our family. That's why they're still intact today, and they're the strongest family out there. The Genovese yeah. families because yeah. you can't talk to the bosses, and they're not going to talk you don't to even you. See them? Yeah, you don't see them. But also, they and they put acting guys in right. spots and it's places. It's very hard to get straightened out with that family. Yeah. The Genovese family, you got to be on record for, what, 10 years, right, at least? Yeah, I mean, that's what they say in New York. In right, our New area, they, see, they don't even straighten out guys in our area. Did you ever get anyone put in? Did you ever straighten anybody out? I was, go on the, that, that was my plan. It's hard was to, to, to build get guys a, in with New York. From, yeah, well, I would have did it in my area, right. which I would have had the okay to do that. Oh, you would have straightened them out yourself? I would have straightened, just like Bobby in his area. Oh, I they were giving you the okay to, yeah, to I get ceremonies Absolutely, they actually wanted us to straighten okay. out a couple wow. of guys yeah, in our area they don't, because oh, they didn't okay. want to do it in New York, yeah. so they wanted us to actually yeah. do the straightening out. Like, this one guy that's there now, they wanted us to straighten him out back in, uh, they wanted Bruno actually to straighten him out in 2001. He was around Matty the Horse and... Um, they wanted us to straighten them out. Why? Because nobody wanted to straighten them out in New York and have that, you know, risk of him, you know, that when you, because when you propose with someone and you straighten them out, you're now responsible. you're responsible for this. So it's they fine. wanted us to do it to get that guy. He never ended up getting straightened out. He got straightened out years later. Okay. Um, What's the straightening out process like for people who don't really understand what that, that terminology is? Well, you get made into the actual, the the actual ceremony. What's that? What, like, what is, goes on? I mean, you got to read GQ if you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> when we did GQ, yeah. we, we went through it. Bobby's good at explaining the actual yeah. ceremony, but it's a 10 yeah. minute process. I mean, it, yeah, everybody it's, eats. You know, I'm not a wise guy anymore. But it's like being a member of the Moose Club. And one way or another, you're still a member. I got to be sure you understand what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> you know, there's some things I don't like to talk about, but it's a ceremony. We take the guys in, we do what we have to do. They swear an oath to us. And that's how it uh, it happens. We'll say it that way. Did you ever watch the Honeymooners? No. You never seen the Honeymooners uh -huh. with Jackie Gleason, I'll watch Ed it. Norton. I watch it tonight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you watch that and the Honeymooners when they join a club, yeah, they grab that thing. And See, they go, he caught that, Johnny. You know what I was talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I was talking about. <laughs> so for that one, go woo woo oh, to me, and you're in. <laughs> that's so funny, Johnny caught that. Yeah. For you, how did you move kind of up the ranks over time? All right, I came back in the nineties. Uh, the Patriarca family was in disarray. They took down a lot of the bosses. I was with a faction that was unliked. And myself and the Luisi family and another family, the Rossetti family, and we were all coming up together, trying to put everything back together. But, you know, I was at a business mind. So, you know, everything was business to me. Mm. To me, it was like a corporation. So I started going out there swing and I started putting everything back together, making money, put money in the street. It was easy for what I did. What I did was unheard of. I took another family into an area that had a family sitting there. But like I said, they were in disarray. I was proposed in the Patriarca family, but things didn't work out. So I kind of like got at odds with them, started taking their stuff. So I reached out to New York uh, to come in maybe as a captain and straighten my crew out. And then I ended up in Philadelphia. But what they did is they gave me the power in Boston that I needed to move up the ladder. You know, when I think you could be the baddest guy in the world, but if you don't get that button, you're not looked on, right? I mean, up there they called us the Luisi family. Mm -hmm. So I have my foot on everybody's neck, especially the Patriarchas, but there's a few Patriarchas that I still love and respect that I grew up with. They were working with me too. So I was working with the Patriarchas. As I was gaining a power and putting everything back together, I'm the type of guy plant flags 
and I'll tell you what that means. I'll go in a neighborhood, I'll grab the crew in there, who's ever the boss, whatever they're doing, you're with me now. So I'm going up, <clears> scooping <throat> these people in, bringing them under my umbrella. And I was building my family. <clears throat> when I went to Philadelphia to get made and straightened out, the agreement I had with Joey and George, it was going to stay with the family for two years, and then I was going to break off and have my own family. That's what we intended to do. I was supposed to be with Philly for a short time. Yeah. So it would have been the Luisi family up there. And slowly keep pushing out the Patriarchas. Now you got to remember, I grew up with these Patriarchas. I was once proposed in that family. So I did business with them. Right. But I made sure I was in the North End. That's gangster capital. We know that little Italy in Boston. And from there, I was running all the way up to Maine, to Connecticut. I was all around. I was even coming around your area. Yeah. And you could tell them that story. I wasn't too liked down there. Yeah. <laughs> you well, you know? came into New York and you met, I think, with, <coughs> with Pete Gotti, right? Well, no, Pete sent me a message. Okay. Because at that time, you know, the commission was gone and Pete yeah. was sitting on the top. He told Gizzy, he said, tell Bobby, in his position, he couldn't do nothing for me. And that's when I went to Philadelphia. Okay. I met Ralph Natali, then I met Joey, I met Georgie. You know, they were great guys. They took me in. You know, Joey was kind of going through the same thing I was going through in Boston. You yeah. know, so we fit good together. You know, until this day, I still like and respect those guys down there for what they did for me. But that gave me the strength to come up to Boston. Now still, the guys that I made and the guys that made while I was away, I would still say that the Philly guys up there are stronger than the Patriarchas themselves right. still to this day. Yeah. You know? And when when did... uh? You know, it all kind of fall apart. I mean, when how many how many bids did you guys do? I did fourteen years. Okay, I did fourteen years myself. I ended up doing fourteen. I went to trial twice. First, I got twenty. <coughs> then I went again. I won an appeal. First one overturned the drug case in Massachusetts. I went back. They, the the guidelines changed. Remember, Johnny? Yeah. When they changed the guidelines, they took they found me guilty again, but they took forty seven months off, and I got on in two thousand thirteen. And when you went in, I mean. Was there regrets? Did you uh, did you know at that point it was done? I mean, what's your mindset when you walk in there? Well, I got to tell you, because it's in newspaper articles and some things you could Google. <clears throat> March of 1998, I had some kind of spiritual experience. You know, I seen guys that I had killed and different things. And <clears throat> it, was, it was something. I don't want to get into it. It's too deep, you know. And uh, that night I took Christ. So now I'm going to church and trying to run my crew and I'm trying to do the right thing with my crew. I felt obligated to. But honestly, at that time, I was just about done. And when that happened, I wasn't forceful anymore. I wasn't chasing down my money. I didn't want to sell drugs anymore. I didn't want to do anything like that. You know, in a way, it was a blessing that I got picked up, to be honest with you. So I got picked up in June of 99. Yeah, I was sneaking to church with a body <coughs> with guns in our backs, and I was going to church every Sunday. Well, my mother had opened a church, non-denominational yeah. church. But you guys were very violent. I mean, for the people that don't know, you guys were violent. Yeah, you we were, were violent, violent, and I, you know, I think that's why that thing happened to yeah. me. I mean, I, I was evil. I was rotten. I didn't care about nothing but myself. I cared about my crew, my family, and my kids, but everybody else, it didn't matter. Life right. or that didn't matter to me. I mean, that's how you get. You get a callus over your heart. Johnny and Anthony know this. You got to whack a guy. This is what you got to do. This is our life. Yeah. But it's all a lie. Yeah. What kind of life is this to live like this? Right. Well, that's the message, Bobby. I mean, yeah. really, the bottom line, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and this is the first time ever that all of us sat like this. I don't yeah. think anybody's ever done this before. We're doing right now with Gene and all of us. Yeah. So I think, uh, and the message back to what we are, you know what my message is to these yeah. kids. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, if you sat at this table and they ever added up uh, all the homicides, yep. uh, the beatings, robberies, stabbings, oh. you, you're talking about uh, hundreds and hundreds between us right here. Yeah. So, and, and the message is the same. And he just said, and Anthony said, said, is uh, it's for the kids, man. It's just not a right life. And you know, and, and really, that's what we're trying to get at. See, the problem we all had is like we were telling you, we all grew up in this. This is what we know. This is what he knew. We didn't know no better. We did all these things in ignorance. Who wants to join? Then you got to go clip somebody. We didn't sign up to be murderers. This is not what we wanted to do, but this is the life that we were in. What are we going to do? 
They call you up, crack that guy, go do this, go. What are you going to do? You got to go. And it could be your friends. That's the messed yeah. up part. Exactly. It happened to me a bunch of times. Exactly. Kill your own friend. And Believe the, me, I know plenty of my friends who wanted to clip me. And, and the part you, is, you know, it turns in the same thing we didn't want to do, we start giving orders to do. Exactly. And we're telling guys the same way, it just goes back into that cycle. Now we're telling guys and sending guys out to do what we did. And, yeah. And, you know, it's just a vicious circle that it just keeps going round and round. What do you, you wish? Know. What do you wish you would have told yourself um, that you now know to a young, a young Bobby? Well, you know, I have some regrets, but not all. You know, I, I get this asked a lot about guys that got killed and friends that got killed, and my answer is I'm sitting here talking with you, so that's the most important thing. I don't have too many regrets. My biggest regret in life was selling drugs. I lost my daughter in December to drugs. You know. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's, yeah. you know, that's my biggest regret wow. that I did that, you know. But um, listen, we all did it. We did it in ignorance. How's a guy like me, uh, after losing everything, how, how am I going to be a millionaire? How am I going to have all this money? How am I going to have this power? See, the problem with us, more than money, is ego and power. Right. You get on the power trip, you can't help it. You know, it's something when you pull up to one night club and five guys want to come and park your car. Doors swing open, you're cut in front of lines. You're like a movie star. You know, you fall into it. It's a trap, but it's all a lie. This whole life, this whole illusion, it's just an illusion. And I realized that. And I realized that that night, and then I accepted Christ. And, you know, when you see your sins in front of you, you know, <clears throat> it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough. You know you did the wrong things. Do I regret what I did? No, because people wanted to kill me, and I'm sitting here. It's a funny thing. I went to a trial, and judge says the, the lawyer said to me, he said, you had your foot, you know, on the neck of the city, on the Patriarca family. You did this, you did that. My father got, my father got killed. My brother, 99 restaurant, family members I lost. And he was coming at me with all these things. And I told him the same thing. I said, you know something? I'm sitting there. And that's what's important to me right now. You know, when we're in the life and we did what we did, we did it. It's over with. You can't have remorse for what you did. But everything that we learned in the life, now we got to come and show others and show them what a lie. You know, we're in prison with gangbangers and what is it, Latin Kings, uh, Mexican Mafia. They were all over us because we were Italian. We were bosses. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm sure, Johnny, they were all over you in they prison. They want to work Anthony. for you, of course. You know? I, I had tons of gang members working for me. Yeah, in and we set examples for these other nationalities and people to follow what we used to do or what we did. You know, and, and it's terrible. Yeah. And you got to think about it. Now, these kids, they watch a movie, they analyze it. <coughs> the young guys, <coughs> there's not too many around anyway up there anymore. Don't get me wrong. They watch The Godfather, Bronx Tales. They want to be gangsters. Hey. They don't know what their life is about. They have no idea. No, they don't understand it. It's a 24-7 horror. That's what it is. It yeah. turns into. After turns a while, into, am I right, Anthony? Yeah, absolutely. Johnny? Yeah. 100%. I mean, after a while, you know. Then you get up in the morning. You put a gun in your back. You go out. You know if you're going to come home at night. You don't know if you got to clip somebody. You don't know what's going to happen. Arrested. Arrested. Now, I got out of prison at 13. I went to work. Love it. I put my head on the pillow every night. I don't got to worry who's coming through the door, right. who I got to clip, who's going to clip me. It's a bad life. It shouldn't be glorified anymore. That's what I got to say about the life. Well, yeah, but well, it's know? God's plan, maybe. Yeah. Maybe that's why I was sitting here. You know, yeah. you got to go through things to be able to teach things. So, you know, there's always a, you know, you got to take out of the negative uh, a positive. The positive is without going through it, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, talk to other kids about it. Yeah. yeah. And for you, Anthony, was it that same kind of mentality? I mean, uh, treachery on a daily basis? Oh, without a doubt, oh, treachery. Oh, but man. for me, it was like for a regret. I would have to say my family for what I put them through, but I wouldn't even say my family. My biggest regret is getting made into the mafia because uh, what we didn't realize is that, you know, I was a millionaire before. I was a millionaire uh, five years six years before I even got made into the mafia. So um, I was shelved, meaning I was, uh, Bruno shelved me yep. you know, when I got caught with the weed. Yeah. So I wasn't even with the, a proposed member and I wasn't even uh, 
you know, with the mafia from 96 to 98. And I made millions of dollars in those years. So what it is, is we didn't need them. No. And uh, my biggest regret is getting uh, made into the mafia. If well, I could go the back. Title, though. The title, right? I was stupid to get right. made. I mean, I didn't need it. Was it was it just ego? like, you know what it was? Yeah, it was you like. want that title. Well, in your mind, it's off. like a legitimate, Listen, a legitimate I was doing enough. anything to get that? it. You know what I mean? That's you know, what you do. You, you, you know, do anything. Well, you want to be part of, like, why did guys join biker gangs or right. clubs? You want to be part of And us growing up, that was like the ultimate for the bad guy in the streets, getting made. That was like, when you got that. That was the ultimate goal for us. So it was always something. But And then you always wanted to think like, you know, our age group is probably the last, you know, 40, late 40s. Uh, under than that, they don't understand what the mafia is about. You know, no. I mean, as far as like Gene and growing up, it's a different era than like when we grew up right. as, you know, going back to the presence of the 70s and 80s with the fight, you know, the commission case and all that. So, um, you know, we didn't need... Uh, so we wanted to be like a like a brotherhood, you know, like somebody mm -hmm. bothers him, somebody bothers uh, someone in the family. Um, we're there for each other, and it's a thing of honor, and it's a thing of, um, you know, it's like it's like a, a high honor to be a made guy. So in, my, in our area, they were treated like kings. Yeah, and I'm Same sure in New York back in the '80s, yeah. and you know, made guy, yeah. they roll out the red carpet for them. Right. Yeah. So it's basically that's what you want. But once you see what it is, I mean, it really you didn't you didn't need that. To make money, first of all, you got. I had guys around me that were my friends. If someone bothered me or them, and we'd go and do what we had to do to hurt the person, even kill the person. We didn't have to be part of the mafia. And as far as making money on the streets, you can. We can do it today. We can make millions of dollars if we chose that path. You know, if, on the streets to make. Who's going to stop us? The only path we choose now is to do it legitimately, make the millions of dollars legitimate, and you know construction bars restaurants whatever that it is to make it legitimately and that's, so you didn't need the mafia so it's like my biggest yeah. regret is that i even joined up with them and uh, and it changes everything for you yeah you got the like orders now yeah. not and not only that you you don't get the same time no more as you were if you were in the mafia because you get a bad just, boss if you're just a regular guy selling drugs you know you might get some time when you start doing it for the organized crime it becomes life yeah they want you to flip yeah. on your guy you know this is what yeah. it becomes it all becomes a tactic you know it's yeah Someone you grew up with, they tell you to go kill them. You got to kill them. If you don't, they kill you. They tell you to come to a meeting. You got to show up at the meeting. You don't know if you're going to get killed. Yeah. You don't show up, you're going to get killed. And if you do show up, there's a good shot. You're going to get killed. killed. Yeah. So, I mean, it's who wants to sign up for anything like that? Mm -hmm. Right. Explain to me what means when you get sent for and you don't go. Yeah, no. you, you can't. If you're part, if you're a made guy, if you're an associate, Even if you're not, you, you still really have, have to. Go. Yeah, you still right, have right. To. Well, you, you could just say, yeah. right, but when you're Going made right. and you don't show up, it's like you know, it's your death sentence back in if you got a real crew yeah. you're with. Well, as Louis de Bono. Yeah, he got He's killed, dead. and that's yeah. part of one of and the murders. Gotti seen you, me. We we all. Uh, he said that's why he killed him. him. Yeah, yeah. That was my message to you know when we had to kill him is because he wasn't showing up, and what he's saying from before is consequences of the life back then compared to today, a big difference when we were growing up. Of course. The yeah. consequences, it was a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of murders back when we were yeah. being raised in this life. Mm -hmm. And we didn't need it. Me and Anthony used to talk about we're making a ton of money. What do we <coughs> We have each other, all of us right here. Yeah. We didn't need anybody because we are the, the guys, you know, that are actually making the money and doing the work. So, well, but, see the, you know. We were making, I, yeah. excuse me, one second, we were making uh, um, millions of dollars in the marijuana business. And I did a lot of business with Johnny in the early 90s, mid 90s. And they consider that like you're, uh, it's legal. They legalize marijuana. I mean, these right. guys in my area, they were like, <laughs> it's narcotics. You know, they wanted to kill me because I got caught with uh, 40 right. pounds of weed in my house. They got, I got raided and they found 40 pounds of weed with some ammunition. Bruno was looking to have me killed because I got caught with marijuana. Today, you can go into a store and buy it. Right. So yeah, like, ridiculous. you know, like these crimes that we commit, the biggest regret is like getting made. And the second thing is if you don't, the violence, yeah, there's no reason to hurt anybody for anything. And if you don't hurt anybody and you do the crimes that we did, the crimes that we did are all, they're not unethical crimes. I mean, you can go to Vegas and bet sports gambling. It's legal, mm -hmm. but we do it. I explained this. And I it's, know. I you know, that, yeah. we can set up a, a place offshore and do the same thing Vegas is doing. And if we don't hurt anybody, what's unethical about it? The only thing is we're not paying taxes. But that's the only crime that's committed. It's not like selling marijuana, it's legal. Loan, loaning money to people. They have that. You know, banks loan money and, you know, 
to people every day. We loan it to them. But the violence, as long as you don't hurt anybody, it's not really unethical crime. Well, that's the excuse they use. Well, right. We, we charge right, a little right, more right. interest and if they want, And if they want to put us in prison, well, this, they, is, this is their beef. a little bit. <laughs> if you don't pay us, uh, 100%. you know it's going to come. But if they don't, but if they put us in prison, if you don't commit, no, we all right. know this. I mean, yeah. I, I had three indictments, uh, 03, 05, and 05, two state, two, uh, one fed. Right. And my crimes were sports gambling, numbers, vending business, uh, racketeer, um, uh, numbers, sports gambling, loan sharking, big numbers. And these were all millions of dollar places. I pled guilty to all of them. I got three years in the state, three and a half years in the state, and I got two and a half concurrent with the feds because there was no violence on the case. Right. That's the so problem. When you, and that, that's three cases, and I was a guy that they wanted really bad, and I still only got three and a half years. So my Until point, they got you with the uh, attempted murder of a union boss, a murder, another murder. Right. And, and let me go back to your banking <laughs> statement just in case. Uh, we charge a little more interest than a bank does. We do, right. right. <laughs> but, but, but as far as like if you get the, the guy, I can't see, right? a, business, a business guy comes up, he's doing a project, he wants 50000 <clears throat> He can't get the job done without it. <clears throat> we give him the 50000 now, if you don't pay you that fifty thousand, right, and that's where the bad <laughs> part the problem is, in. right? I mean, you know, but is it bad for him not to pay the fifty back? Right. I mean, think about it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a bad thing for the guy not to do. But violence is the thing that kills us all. If, if that's the violence and when you're in it that collapsed life, families, yeah, it collapsed the right. mafia. Today, violence. today these guys get indicted and they get indicted for racketeering. And they go away for three years, yeah. two years, and they cry about going to jail for two years. I mean, you got guys crying that they're going in for two years, and um. Probation. And, and with no violence on the case, you know, you're looking at three years. I got that in the hole. Uh, uh, I got, no, yeah, there's guys years. that talk over probation. I'm being honest with you. No, they, I they know. They get probation on their record. Yeah. yeah. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel like it's easy to stray away from that now? To, to know what you're capable of or know what kind of money you're capable of making illegitimately? Do you feel like it's... Um, been easy since you got out to, to not go back? I mean, for me, it's hard because I know how easy it is to make money on the streets. I mean, it's so easy yeah. that it's just like, it's like you just want, you know, it's just for the money part. It's so easy to do that you want to do that. So that's the hard part because, it, you know, guys that are earners know mm -hmm. how easy it is to go out and start hustling and whether, you know, it's little of this, little of that. And before so you know it, you're making 5000 10000 a week. So after the show, I'll get you 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're going to be calling. I'm, but no, don't oh. Oh, I'm joking. Oh, no. Well, I me, can't be serious. It was funny. I went down to Tennessee. Right. And uh, I married a woman down there. Beautiful woman. Great person. And she was an IT manager for Sandusky Cabinets. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of blacks in there, Spanish, well, nice people. Made a ton of friends down there. So they hired me to go in and kind of straighten the place out, which I did. Right. You know, I got production up and had a few uh, headbutts with the union officials. Whatever I did, right. I did. And we got the factory rolling again. But at that time, I came out of what I was doing. And now I'm on Facebook and reporters are coming to talk to me. So everybody knows who I am now. I can't tell you how many times I was approached. They call me Alonzo down there. Right. Alonzo, we could do this, we could do that. But okay, get out of here with this yeah. bullshit. Because they need a leader. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of people out there today. If they know they could earn with you, right. they don't care what you did, right. they want to earn. Yeah. Right. So it's tempting. It is. But in good conscience, I can never do that again. Yeah. Well, I know, can never yeah. do that. You know what I noticed about being violent? Because, I mean, for my time, I, yeah. was, I was really violent. You did violent. a lot of violence. I did a lot of violence. I yeah. did. I, I wasn't whacking guys, you know, like back in the 80s you know, like that, but I was really violent. Yeah. But let me tell you something. It's a double-edged sword with that violence because it's like this. Guys won't deal with you because you're too violent. Right, right. You know what I mean? But you always get paid your money because you're violent. Right. Yeah. So it's, it, it's not... It's, it's, it's and a, if you're not, you're soft, you're weak, they take the kindness for weakness. There you go. So you it's such paid. a confusing life. You know, yeah. I was always taught you got to make sure you're violent in that life. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, you got you always do what they tell you to do no matter what it is. Okay. But it also hurt me because nobody would deal with me with certain things. They didn't want to borrow money off me because they knew I would hurt them if they didn't pay me. Yeah. They yeah. want to deal with the soft guy. You yeah. know what I mean? And it was a double-edged sword. You know what I mean? How'd that work out for you? Well, I was a spoiler with money. You know, right. I had all the money up there. Bookmakers, who needs 80000 who needs 50000 Right. Well, I dealt with a very big loan shark. Yeah, you. Yeah. I, I had a guy who was giving me 2400 a week for two years. Actually, it was through one of my guys. Because if you're a main guy in my crew, I gave it to you for a point. You have to. It's you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's proto. That's yeah. what we do. I got two-point guys, whatever. Right. You know? This poor bastard's paying 2400 a week for two years. 
I got my money back. I don't know how many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I, the pig that he was working with, because he ended up ratting on me, goes to prison, he comes to me. I knock him down to 800 a week. Right. Yeah. Then I meet him again. He's doing bad with his book. What am I going to do? I say, all right, it's on the shelf. 80000 Wow, Look. you're a good guy. Well, listen, you want to know so it's business. Right. right. No, it was good. I, I dealt with guys that wouldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. But see, that that's greed. Yeah, I, I dealt you, you with a greedy guy. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't be a good boss doing that. Yeah, I dealt with a real good I'm here. Guy. I'm protecting you. Yeah. I'm giving you money to run your business. Right. Because I got to remember what I took from this man. Yeah. You know? I got other guys. I wasn't big into extortion. If you were alone shotgun on the street here, take 10 of my and make sure you send me money every week. Right. I learned that from the Anjulo family. That's right. what they did years ago. If you were a bookmaker, I'd rather you work with me. Right. If you were a drug dealer, and I found out you had to be with me. Damn. You understand? That's how I did business. Right. And it worked all good for me. I made millions. Thanks yeah. for making big money. You know, so it's not that um, you, you got to be hard with them all the time. Well, um, you know, I always get ridiculed because I was a big arm robber. I did a lot of arm robberies. That's what, how you came up in the old school days, right? That was heists. I always get called a thug, a low, you know, all this stuff. Isn't that part of the game? I always thought. I was taught. I wasn't into that. You're robbing bad guys. I wasn't. Right? Yeah. Robbing bad guys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're robbing yeah. other crime yeah. guys. You're doing heists. There's nothing wrong with that in the life. Because I only did a few things, but that wasn't my, you know, everybody's different. Everybody does their own thing. Right. Like this guy in the corner was a bad guy. <laughs> and we know why they called him. You, you understand? <laughs> but this guy did what he wanted to do. Right. So he did what he had to do and take care of his own things. You, you, if I recall, you were a heist guy. I, did a I, did a, I, did a I think we all did. In that <laughs> yeah, life, yeah. you had to do it. Right, but they, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. It always yeah. comes with the territory, you know. right? That's why Felix, every right. time I tell you we do the shows, you got to hurt him when he doesn't cut him. Right? <laughs> if I, I had a guy on the street <laughs> that was shy in the door, because I was uh, like a half a snake. Right. You know, we weren't really working together. You know, I didn't go after everybody. I grew up right. with a lot of guys yeah. over there. But I count this, any 50. You want to give it to me because you don't want a problem. And then I tell you to screw that's right. how I would. But I got to right. ask you something, Bobby, because yeah. you said you guys didn't, you weren't into the robberies and heists, but there is one heist that I want to talk about. Which one? You guys had a major heist out in Boston that... Uh, oh, the art heist? Yes. Tell us about that. The Garden Museum. Well, I'll tell you a story. That crew, we ended up together in like 93. They did that in 90. Right. So I had safe houses all over I the I know city. a couple of those guys. That's what yeah. I'm and I had a safe house in uh, Walton, beautiful place. You know, I had to go miles. I used to go sneak up there, you know. So I'm sitting with Bobby uh, Garanti on the right couch. Here. Miles comes on TV. He says to me, I know where the artwork is. What? Well, yeah, I know where the artwork is. And I'm thinking, he said, can you do anything with it? Because now we're in New York, we're in Philly. He thinks we're going to move this shit. I said, Unc, that's what we call yeah, him. Yeah, right. He used to I, run. He's some runner, by the way. He can yeah. run. I said, Unc, listen. I, I can't move that. I can't move a pack of cigarettes. You want to move artwork? I says, I, you know, I don't know what to do with this shit. I let her go. But I wouldn't know where it was buried, where it was. But see, I'm not a pusher. Yeah. If I send Anthony or Polly to go do something, I don't ask for explanations when they come back. Did you take care of that? That's all I want to know. Mm -hmm. That's the type of guy I was. Yeah. Everybody was amazed that I didn't dive into that. Well, what was I going to do with it, John? I mean, yeah. Anthony, what am I going to do? Turn it in and collect the $25 million reward. If I knew this at the time. <laughs> That's what they want, $25 million Meanwhile, reward. Meanwhile, I got every organization oh looking God. at it. Yeah, it's yeah, worth like $600 million. Million. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I kicked myself up the ass every they day. They never found the guys that did it, never found the art. Yeah. Well, Bobby Garanti's dead. You yeah. were with Bobby Garanti? Yeah, yeah, Bobby. I know Miles good. That was yeah. a bit, that was a, so, I think Bobby Gentile. So he probably did it, and, you know, that's it. Yeah, he didn't tell me he did it. He says, I know where it is. That's what he told me. You know, and I I didn't pursue it. You know, so when they came to me about it, the feds, Bobby was that's so I talked about it. Yeah. I told them what he told me. Steve Kirchin took it a step farther. They went down to his old house. They ripped it down. Because mm. he said Bobby is buried under a slab in Florida. Now, I know he had a few properties down there. But I guess one of them, they got down there, they ripped it out. They probably yeah. moved everything. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby died. I don't know if anybody knows where it is. Right. I have no idea. But I wish I knew. Yeah. <laughs> that was the biggest robbery in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah biggest. Yeah. Yeah. Still till today. Really? Yeah. Big, yeah. Yeah. And they wow. said that Garanti's wife had one of the pieces. There was a little stamp. I don't know who did it. Rembrandt. I don't know who did it. Yeah. I'm not an art guy. I'm not going to try to be. But I think the stamp was worth I don't know how many millions. Wow. And she showed it to Bobby Gentile that she had it, you know? Right. 
And uh, so they came after me. They wanted me to talk against Bobby Gentile. So I'm not going to talk against him. You never mentioned that to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's how that ended up. <laughs> I'm in two books over that. I did. Uh, that's why I kept driving back and forth to Boston. I was trying to find <laughs> yeah. that. No. I'm See in two guys. books over that. I did uh, a documentary for the Travel Channel. Right. And Japan flew over. It was in Tennessee. Yeah. They got a hotel room. December, December, I came home in October. It was uh, September. They got a hotel room, and I did it. I did one with the Japanese over that. Well, here's a, here's something that people don't know that uh, I might as well spill a little bit about it. Uh, we have uh, Nicholas Pelleggi that's involved with those guys on a series. It should be, I think, about eight part series that we're going to be coming out with. It's mm -hmm. uh, something that's first time ever done. He's the executive producer on it. And uh, all of us are looking forward to it. And uh, it's going to be something that uh, I think it's going to be phenomenal when we finish with it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. I'm hoping. Is there a time frame on it? You know? Uh, you'll tell me after. Not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> tell me after. Uh, we're just going to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor, the show Manscaped. The Johnny and Gene Show is brought to you by Manscaped. And our partners at Manscaped are here to ensure that you're taking care of your manhood and your nose hairs now with their new performance package. Ooh. You need one? We'll, huh? we'll get you one. All right, I want one. <laughs> Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Included in this new package is this thing called the Weed Whacker. Ear and nose hair trimmer, which is waterproof and uses 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate places. This bundle includes the Lawn Mower 3.0 trimmer as well, the best trimmer on the market for your balls and everywhere on your body. Go to manscaped.com today, and when you use promo code JG, you'll receive 20% off and free shipping. Again, you'll get this new performance package on manscaped.com, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping on everything on the entire site when you use that promo code JG at manscaped.com. Go check it out today. Beautiful. Hey, it nice. really works well. I use it. And everybody that uh, doesn't know about KCL Automotive, it's my company up in PA. It's in East Stroudsburg, 98 at Henry Street. My cousin Steve runs it with Dave. It's a uh, automotive. It's uh, a really unique place. You can have a one-stop shop whether you want to buy a car, you need body work, you need an auto automotive work. You need any kind of uh, work done at all, just contact my cousin Steve at 570, let's see. 534. 534-8497. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank right. you, everybody. Now, getting back into it, uh, I think, I don't remember who said it, but um, I think it was Anthony who talked about the effects of being in the, the mafia and, that it had on your family um, and how... You know, I guess for all you guys, and I know these two specifically have talked about it a lot before, but it takes a big toll on on family. Um, we talk about what that was like for you, and uh, you know, if you've been able to make amends with them, if there's if there's still resentment on their ends for all the time you did away and all the activities that you did when you were in the life. Yeah. So, I guess the uh, the toll it takes. I mean, if you're doing a couple of years, three years. And you, we have money coming in, obviously. I mean, I, w I went to jail. I went to prison in 05. And um, I had anywhere from, if it was a good month, 100000 a month coming in that would go to my wife at the time. So uh, if you got money like that, it's really not hard on the families right. on the street because, mm -hmm. you know, they miss their husbands, you know. Um, they don't have that, you know, their husband home. But when you got, they don't have to worry about any bills. I mean, I was getting a hundred, you know, never mind your wife doesn't have to work, but she's getting a hundred thousand a month. Plus, she, you know, she had access to over a, a million dollars at the time by me being in prison. And I did three and a half years. And uh, obviously she went to about a million and a half of that money, <laughs> oh you know, God. because... Uh, is this an ex-wife? Yes, my ex-wife. All right, so and, uh, did she spend it alone? We want to know. Was it? She was like, my little kids were like three and four years old wow. um, at the time. My son was like around 10. And uh, she was, you know, she was just, a, you know, she just went out spending money. She had no, I, you know, uh, she was buying my kids three years old, $500 outfits. 
Well, I mean, he, I came home. They were in the closet with the tags still on them, five hundred dollars. On her, on her understanding, he, she, he ran everything, so they yeah. don't really have understanding of that money. They think Unlimited. it's going to last forever. Yeah. She they went to know. Florida twice yeah. a year, yeah. you know, with her, with living. the family and the kids. Oh, yeah, I mean, she was spending ten thousand a week. I mean, what you spending? I'll upgrade the car. You know, she went from a brand new BMW paid for to a brand new Lexus with a loan on it. Um, you know, five hundred dollar true religion jeans, five hundred dollar outfits. I mean, it was you know, to, uh, refurnish the house, give it to her mother, refurnish it again, give it to her sister, well, refurnish it again, give it to the brother. <laughs> Florida twice a year, taking the whole family with them. Yeah, I yeah, mean, what I it's just him. it adds up. You guys got to marry into the mob. Yeah, what I, no, that's why I asked him. Is he sp she spending it alone? Well, you because see, you're spending on your whole family. That's yeah, what you're doing. And you know, it, it adds up. And anyway, so if you got the money. It's not really, and you're only going away for, I, I only did three years, three and a half years at the time. So it's not a lot. What is a lot is when my kids now, you know, obviously it's heartbreaking on the kids. If you have children, three and four years old, my two little girls, you love them to death. And you are just like heartbroken that you got to be away from them. But it was only for three and a half years. What do you tell them? So at that point, I didn't tell them nothing that, that I just went to work. I had to go to work. They come visit so me in prison. And they'd, I'd be at work. Dad, we're going to go see Daddy at work. What the hardest part was, I knew when I got out in 2008, you know, I, I, like I said, I had three cases. And then I got indicted while I was in prison. I went to trial. I got found not guilty. So I knew I was coming home now. I, you know, I was hoping I was coming home because I knew I was always going to get indicted for murder or whatever. But I just didn't know, you know, maybe I'll escape it. I'm hoping. And um, so I got home in 08. And I was out till 2010. And I found word that I was gonna get indicted for a murder. And uh, so I had explained to my little daughters, and this time now they're six and five, they can talk and they can understand things. And they, so I remember, you know, I had my oldest daughter, Sophia, on my lap, and uh, I had to tell her, I said, Daddy might have to go back to work, that work again. And uh, she just grabbed me so hard and she hugged me and she said, no, Daddy, you're lying. And, and I felt so bad. It was like, you know, really it felt horrible that I was gonna have to leave them again. So then she leaned back, she grabbed my face, looked at it, and she says, Daddy, you're lying to me, right? And I said, yes, yeah, Sophie, I'm lying. I'm not going back to work. And then she, she was all happy. So, I mean, that's the biggest part. When you, uh, and then I wasn't going away for two years or three years. I mean, I was going away for the rest of my life. So, I mean, you know, anybody that loves their kids and loves their family um, to have to go through that, I don't care what you did on the streets. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean you don't love your, your kids, you know, so... Uh, um, that's the hardest <coughs> part, you know, is uh, having to say, you know, see, you know, have to have them go through that again. Do they ask you about it today? You know, right now, the relationship is uh, we're just I'm trying to get it back together with them. I don't forget I was gone for eight and a half years. I mean, you know, you know, everything came out with my trials, murders and everything. So I put them through a lot with that. So hopefully one day everything will be good. You did a lot of time, right? Total. Yeah, my whole life. Yeah. And, and for you, Bobby? Uh, it was tough on my family. You know, I did, uh, like I said, I did 14 years. You know, my uh, Danielle was 16. My Robbie was uh, 13. And the baby, I think, was two years old. And uh, it was hard on all of them. You know, it was really hard on me. And uh, like Anthony said, you got to try to build relationships back up again with them. I mean, I left my son. who was with me the other night. We were hanging out, you know. My daughter, I see her once in a while, we go take her for lunch, you know, but it's not like they grew up with me. You know, on the street, I was wild. I had all the safe houses, I had to do Lumaz. I used to go home on the weekend, my poor kids, you know. So they were used to me not being there. You know, and then I, uh, I left them for 14 years. You know, financially, I didn't leave her the way I should have left her. I'll be honest with that. And I, my wife was beautiful. I married an Irish girl. You had to see this girl, you know? And I love my wife, but I was an animal. Not with her, but the way I lived. Yeah, my, you know, I wasn't a good husband in that way. Well, I don't know anybody who is that's in our life. No, yeah, I gave her yeah, everything I could, cars, clothes, houses, whatever I could give her, you know? But it was like buying her. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? As much as I loved her, I couldn't even show that love, you know? Like I said, you get that callus over your heart and it affects everybody. You know, but uh, my kids now, we're getting close. It's good. I'm with my son. I'm happy about that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I love my kids. They love me. They understand now. But it's hard. Your father's gone. Yeah. 
you know, it was hard for them. And for you, Paul? For me, it's, um, I guess, when um, they read your name in the newspaper, you know, you're on the front page, and all of a sudden, you know, your mother's just, all her friends are talking, yeah. and she's got to deal with all the repercussions of what they're saying and stuff oh, like yeah. that. And the same thing for the children, because the kids are over their friends' houses, and the parents are talking in front of the children, but... And then the children will go back and say something to their friends. Say, oh, we heard your father's this. We heard your father's that. And Is there a feeling of shame? Um, it wasn't so much shame. It was like, I felt like I shamed my family more than I shamed myself. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it was worse. Like, you know, look, having to get up out of bed and you go look at your mother like, okay, you're in the newspaper again. You know, and I'm like, oh, you said you weren't going to do this. Why do you keep doing this? And I'm like, I don't know if I knew why I was doing it. I probably wouldn't. But And how, how long did you go away for um, which time? <laughs> <laughs> Total, I guess. Total, um, say um, all combined eight, and probably sixteen on paper. Sixteen, yeah, yeah. definitely on paper at wow. least. And I mean, when you're when you're in there, are there regrets on what you did, who you're hanging out with, and um, no, I was hanging out with a lot of my childhood friends. It just it like I says, you know, like, there's regrets about the things you did, and the, but then you think back, you're like, if I wasn't with my friends at certain instances, some of my friends wouldn't be here. Do you wish you had different childhood friends? No, no, I really don't. And uh, also, Polly actually is lucky to be here. He overturned a double what double murder case. Double, yeah, Are double natural want... life. I was serving. How that work? How do you overturn it? Um, F. Lee Bailey took my case and. Uh, it was the actual, the eyewitness to the murder was the actual murderers. So when they offered me to take a lie detector test, I did. And then they tried to tell me I couldn't use it and we went through all these things. And if it wasn't for Ethley Bailey and the entire firm um, taking my case, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you, so you take the lie detector test? And I pass it. And you pass it? Yes. And, and then? Three simple questions. And then that's like when- What were the questions they asked you? If I fired any of the shots that killed, um, should I say the names? I won't go to I, Yeah, I don't want to say the first name. Well, you know, it's killed one we person. I fired any of the shots <laughs> that killed the other person <laughs> off. I was in that park that night when the incident happened. And three notes, so three in a minute notes, and you're and out. That, and that was it. And that saved your life, basically. Um, uh, no, they ended up not using it, but it did get uh, me a second trial. And my second trial, the jury was allowed to hear the real evidence about the eyewitness. And at one point, the eyewitness got so frustrated, he actually con- like confessed to the murders, then recanted. And once the jury heard that, like they just wanted to throw this whole case out, and they came back you with not lucky. guilty right away. I got really lucky. I shouldn't be sitting here right now. What's, and then the, when you know that you're going to get out, I mean, what's the feeling? Thinking that you could be away your whole life, and now all of a sudden they're telling you you're free. Um, not, ever think, not ever thinking that you're ever coming home was the worst for Ellen. And then hearing that you might come home, you don't want to get your hopes up because, like, you're like, yeah, everybody here says that. You know, right. you hear so many guys locked up say the same thing. Yeah. Like, I'm going to overturn my case this week, or I'm going in, I'm going to over. And you, you get heartbroken, and you're sitting with guys that have been doing 35 years. And you're sitting there and you're listening to them. And you got a chance. And yeah. The, yeah they're they're coming on doing the same yeah. things. Yeah. Don't get into it. What are yeah. the, the <laughs> go, go for it. Go. No, here's the problem. Yeah. Especially being a May guy in the mob, Johnny, everybody here. If I call Johnny from Boston and say, so and so's down there, can you do this favor for me? <clears throat> and Johnny went and do it, which he probably would yeah. years ago. Okay. Now, uh, what happens is, because I called and they say I gave the order, Johnny might get away with it and I might get the death penalty. There was a, I was with uh, Pete Rose in the Bonanno family. He told me one murder, who brought the guy, who drove the guy, who killed the guy, who buried the guy. 13 guys in New York got arrested over one murder. And the problem with that with the mob is all the conspiracy. Well, they want the guy pointing, don't they, usually? Yeah, and that's what happened with me. Right. You know, and then the, what I was facing would have been on that penalty right. charge. Well, you had a guy, and I won't mention his name, and uh, because I think he could get re-indicted again, but he nodded, and he was on video. When, yeah. When a guy asked him, uh, you want to hit a guy? And he, he, he looked at the camera, not knowing it was a camera, and he nodded, gave the okay. Yep. And they pinched him for uh, Rico and a murder. So they need. Yeah, yeah. never talked, so never need. got caught on an audio. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And my standing with the FBI isn't good. And this is why I'm careful what I say. Yeah. I don't know if you all know my case, right. but I fought them, yeah. you know. Not to change the subject, I, I wanted to ask you something from you to uh, your point of view on this. The, the nonviolent <clears throat> guy and the violent guy, the earner, 
the violence, whatever. A true gangster, we don't glorify this stuff no more. I'm just saying when you were living that life, you never really respect the money guy like you respect the violent guy. Let's be honest. Yeah, I'm not trying to glor. I'm just trying to, because people always ask me this question, why you do this? Explain to them that because you come from bosses and violent. Explain why. Well, being a boss, this is how it works. Like right. I said, it's like it's a business. Even the old school was a business. Right. When you set a company up, not everybody's the secretary, right? Right. Not everybody drives the forklift. Everybody got their own job to do. Right. See, I respected everybody in the crew. But to me, a book bookmaker, a half fast loan shark, they have civilians. Right. You, you never know? give them the same respect as the guy pulling the triggers and doing the work. Everybody gets a different respect for what they do. Right. right. You gotta have bad guys, okay? You gotta have tough guys, and you have to have earnest. And with other combination right. of that, it's not gonna work. Right. When I made all my guys, they all did you know, work, right. Not all of them, but most, they were involved in something. Right. You understand? They were my close crew, you know, because out of all my guys, it was probably the least of them. Well, because I was sitting back giving a lot of artists, too. Right. I'm not going to lie. I'm uh, not Al Capone, you right. understand? But the thing is here, if I didn't have those guys around me, a lot of things wouldn't have got done. Kavish, if I didn't have the earners, I wouldn't be making money. If I didn't have the tough guys, I got no one to come and break ahead. Right. Everybody got their part to play. You don't send the tough guy to kill somebody. You don't send the bookmaker to kill somebody. Am I right? There's certain people that do certain things. Well, that's what makes certain guys, uh, you know, a big commodity in their life. And I'll use Anthony because we're friends, but also because he became a boss. But he was, he had a different right. quality. He was uh, like a, a Babe Ruth of baseball. He hit the ball, he knew yep. how to earn, yep. and he knew how to kill, and yep. he's quiet, he's intelligent. I mean, there's not a lot of guys out there, Bobby, you know that. No, that, I know that. have that, that ability. No. And you, when you find right. guys that have the ability to hold package, sure, guys want you. See, I like to involved. say, John, I was an all-around guy. Right. right. That's right. what right. I consider I'm just saying, because the guy I answered to was treacherous. Murders, he did it all, yeah. but he never respected non, the non-violent guy. You know, that was my, that's what I was getting to. A lot of the times, they didn't respect the guys that didn't do work. They looked at them as like, uh, they bought their way in. You know what I'm trying to say? And that's Yeah, but you want to know he's right, though. There was a lot of guys like that, though. Right. You know? I was uh, with but, one guy, Richie, in the Bonanno family. You know, I don't want to say his last name. I was talking to him about it. He claims he did something, you know? He said it took him 16 years to get a button, the poor bastard. It's terrible. So what was he doing? Carrying laundry? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, you make a cappuccino, where's the machine? I well, think. back to what he's saying, Bob, you know, or Anthony, or, you, yeah. or Paulie. I agree with you to an extent. The guy that's an earner, if he oversteps his bounds and behaves like he's more than an earner, then he doesn't get that respect. Then, then he gets the other side of everybody where we abuse him a little bit. Yeah. But when he keeps and he stays in his lane and he just lets people know that he was just an earner, this is who I am, that's okay. You got to respect if you, that. you respect his position. It's yeah. when they be, behave and right. they throw that cigar in their mouth right. and they're running around the street and telling you they're a boss or they're a killer when they never cracked an egg. Yeah, then they're going to get the abuse from us. What's your take on that? Well, no, I, like Felix asked earlier how you uh, get ahead in this life. How do you, mm -hmm. you know, excel to that next level? And Johnny hit it right on is... You got killers, and then you have earners. But how you really get ahead in that life, and I think a lot of us here, all of us here, are we can kill, but we can also earn. That's right. And that's, that's what makes, makes a person dangerous, dangerous in that's that life. That's, a, that's what I'm saying. You know? That was a gangster. That's what yeah. my boss explained to right. me. They didn't respect yeah. the guy that made the money. I'm just going to be, that's how right. I, you know. When you put those two together, now you have the brains to uh, be a boss, the yeah. brains right. to put things together, right. to put a family together, a crew together. Exactly. And you also have that, right. uh, that yeah. killer in you where if someone gets out of line, you can send someone, but you're going to go with them also and kill the right. and kill I'm, with them. I'm like sending little subliminals here. That's what I'm trying to say. A captain, I would work for you. I respect you because I know you're capable of doing what, I, what you're going to send me to do. Right. I'm not going to work for a guy that never busted a great. Right. That call themselves capital regimes and they never did nothing. In right. Their lives. Right. Right. You know that's what I'm saying. But that those I was in that position. Right. That's what I said. That's what I was getting to. I was right. a boss in my area, and every hit that I was in on, that went down in my area while I was a boss, I participated in. Right. So there wasn't one beating that I told somebody to do that I wasn't there or one hit. That but I you wasn't guys there. know the same thing, just what we're saying. 
We have guys that made money for us that were our piggy banks. And if you go near them, yeah, we'll rip you apart. Of course. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, you go near our money. The golden right, goose. Right, right. We ha I had them. Yeah. We all had them. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, right. I mean, it, it all works hand in hand. But listen, in any life, what Bob, you were saying earlier, intelligence wins out on everything. It does. You, know, you, you need to be intelligent first, and then everything else follows after that. you got to learn how to hold it together. Yeah. You know, you could be a tough guy, killer. What does that mean? I right. had a hundred of them yeah. around me. What does that mean? Yeah, and when you, get a, when you get a dumb killer, he's just, that's what he is. He's a dummy. He's They're a, around you because they can't earn on their own, yeah. Johnny. Yeah. yeah. They're hanging on to you. Yeah. I need them, so I got them there. Yeah. You understand? These guys, they work for me. They weren't in the mob. They were with us, but they weren't made guys, yeah. you know? They were just some people. This is what they did. This is what you used them for. But they did have a capability to be, they were with us, and they could earn. Because they, listen, we could all say this. You don't got to be a rocket scientist to sell drugs. Right. right. You got to have muscle. Mm -hmm. You got to be smart. Yeah. You got to be able to know how to evade the law. You know what I mean? You know they're coming after you. I lasted years doing this, you know? These kids out there as gangbangers, they make it two, three, four thousand a week. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of the problem with the mob today. Why does Anthony got to be a May guy if Anthony go and grind 5000 a week? Why do I got to be with you? Right. What is it, your business? You know, and I started saying that before. Mm. You couldn't, we couldn't even recruit these young kids. They make our money on their own. Yeah. You understand? But to really put something together, to organize something, that's where that all comes in. You got to be an all-around guy. If you're not gonna, a good businessman, you're not going to make it. Yeah. It's not going to happen, you know? So this is what it is. That's what it's about. This is why some people excel and some don't. I was with a lot of bad guys up there. Bad, these guys are bad guys. They kill you in a minute. But they respected me and they listened to me. You know? You have to have some type of charisma. You know? You got to be a sharp guy. You got to know how to earn. You got to know what fights to pick. We're talking about people's lives here. You got some bosses didn't give a shit about. They wanted to clip everybody. Right. No, I wasn't like that. Yeah. You know, I use my head. You know, we don't got to kill everybody. Let's kill the dangerous guys, obviously. Right. You know, we don't got to kill everybody. We don't have to make a move like that. You know? Well, in, our, in our day, we had to, and that's why people didn't understand. It was a lot of treacherous guys out there. And well, look what happened. We went through in it the 90s. Yeah, it doesn't happen today, so. Huh. When they're waiting outside the house, they're going to clip. I went through this a few times. You know what I'm saying? It was dangerous. Some guys had to go, you know, but for the most part, and Johnny and Anthony will tell you, a lot of them are full of shit. Yeah. Right. And you know that. Yeah. Right. Well, They're that's what I'm getting shit. to. I'm trying to, you know. No, I hear what you said about yeah. that guy. You know what I mean? If your crew can't respect you on what you did, how are you going to get anywhere? Right. How are you going to tell me to go do something you never did? Well, you because I mean? because it's easier to say, especially Well, this is now. what was happening to me in Boston. Right. Yeah. I'm planting flags. I'm not even a made guy. I'm already a boss. How right. many communities that I have? Right. We're in Revere. We're in Ever. We're in some. I'm taking over everything. I'll move. I didn't even have a button yet. I was a boss. I was making millions. I didn't need Philly. Yeah. But in our minds, to be legitimate in that life, of course. Yeah. we got to get a button. Right. Yeah. I want everybody straightened out. And that's why I pursued that. Yeah. yeah. But did I need Philly? No. I didn't call them and ask them to come and do something for me. Right. Actually, the deal was, John, Boston's Boston's Philly, Philly. There's going to be no build, uh, business in between. Right. That's how we had it set up. Don't mind me slurring a lot. I didn't sleep last night, Anthony. <laughs> oh, well said. <laughs> well said. <laughs> you guys celebrating a little bit. Oh, my. Night. How much scotch did I'm I have? I'm glad I didn't show up. <laughs> Thank you. Come on. What, uh, what's the scene like? Angle. What's the scene like? Uh, you know, we kind of know that here in New York it's dead uh, in, in the modern day. But, you know, what's the mafia like now in Boston in the mass area? Is it still prevalent? Oh, I know that uh, in our old crew, there's, there's still plenty of them up there. There's a good handful of them up there, and there's some patriarchas left up there. Canada is real bad right now. Is it really? Oh, Canada is wild right now. Oh, Canada, yeah. yeah. Canada's Paulie, what joints right were you in, by the way? You started talking before you started to mention. Walpole, uh, Concord, uh, MC, uh, Fort Devens. Yeah, that's what we were talking yeah. about, Devens. Yeah. 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 That's where I was with Stevie yeah, last yeah. time I was with him. Right, right. Yeah, and then Devin. I go upstate, and he's upstate. I'm like, what do you just beat me to these yeah. places? <laughs> <laughs> His brother got banged over bed, right? He's yeah. finished. He's, he... yeah, I think they finally let him out of Colorado. Yeah. Oh, they did. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where he is now. Like yeah. I said, I haven't seen Stevie in five years at yeah. least. But looking forward to seeing yeah, it. Yeah. 
Now, how did how did like technology and cameras and all that really affect the way you guys did work as, over the years? I mean, well, it didn't affect. It didn't, I, when I went away, I had it. a flip phone and a beep. <laughs> right. But you were a little bit more <laughs> yeah. technology. Came Ninety nine, you were right? all, you yeah. The that's well, one yeah. way is he's uh, modern day. He's, he's more technology recent. is yeah. uh, you don't have the the phone guy no more for the sports. Oh. I mean, you know, we used to have you know, say you had a hundred customers that were betting with you. You needed three phone guys, maybe yeah. even four, yeah. to handle them right. And uh, with that comes, you know, all kinds of problems. And now it's just one one eight hundred number, Costa Rica. Not even online. And, um, you just go on. Well, the site I mean, you still got to have the yeah. site set yeah. up and ever. Yeah, they do it by points. And, uh, or something, right? You eliminate the phone oh, guy. It's amazing how they do it now. You don't. Li- you still got to pay for that. I didn't even look into it. You eliminate yeah, the. That. Uh, that's one way it helped out a lot is the uh, elimination of the actual phone guy. You know, calling up the phones busy. Uh, you know, the, the lines you put out, the lines change so quick, and he puts out a wrong line, and these sharp guys come in and bet you, and they destroy you. They're robbing a point and a half, two points, and mm-hmm. so it eliminated all that. That was a huge thing for sports gambling. Now, also, just back to the question I asked before, compared to at, at your guys' prime, I mean, how much you know, mafia crime activities are going on compared to when you guys were around. Well, I, I actually said when I got picked up, because, you know, they cut the head of the snake off and my crew fell apart a little, but they're still there. Mm-hmm. It's never been as strong, I think, when I was there. Am I right? Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, I don't think it's been as strong. And there's definitely no violence going on no more. No. But, no. Well, I think no they kind of, uh, I mean, I'm more modern day, I can tell you, they kind of eliminated murders. Yeah, they're Because of all the heat, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, they ordered me to kill somebody in 06, and that's the last time I could say the banana. I wish they did it. All uh, three, yeah. they started. <laughs> that's like, they really stopped, uh, they really stopped all that violence right now. Guys, got well, these guys getting strained out right now. You would laugh. They haven't even threw a punch. Never been in a fist fight. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm a guy. You're a guy. You never been in a fight. But I don't even think. <laughs> I don't. I don't even think it's that so much the violent end. Of it. I don't think they understand the life. No, I think they these don't. guys don't. They understand. watch a movie. Yeah, yeah, they watch no. a movie. They really they don't, don't they get have it. no idea. They I don't mean, understand the interaction between crews. They don't understand no, the respect of it. It's lucky it, that I was groomed by who I was groomed by. Yeah. I paid attention to whom I was with yeah. when I was a kid. Right, you know. And I knew better. Yeah. You know, a lot of these kids, they're jumping up, they're racing, they want to do this and that. I come from old school observation. My. Sit back, yeah. watch, see what's going on. Well, they, the way they talk to each other now, guys are straightened out. They're talking to each other where back in our day, you've ever did that, you're getting clipped for that. Yeah. So they don't even, from the, some of the stuff you were telling oh them, they don't God. even have the understanding of the respect they of have, this. They have guys that want to know, want to let them know that they're made guys. So they would actually go to guys and be like, oh, well, I can't be near you. I might be on your list. I remember my guy looked at a guy and goes, are you trying to tell me you're straightened out right now? Mm-hmm. Get the fuck away from me. Like, <laughs> That's he was dying doing. to say that I was a made guy, you know what yeah, I mean? So he's yeah, going, yeah. oh, I might be on your list. He's going, get away from me, bro. Like, come on. You're trying to tell me you're a guy? All right, mm-hmm. great. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how bad it's getting. <laughs> That's what yeah. it is. Bobby was telling a good story the other night about a guy who walked around staring at his finger for the next couple of days. <laughs> I'm not going to say his name. <laughs> no, I, I did. You know, we had a few different ceremonies. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys, I swear to God, we leave the thing. He's staring at his finger. You know, you got yeah, you're pricked. Yeah, you get pricked. For people that don't know, it's, yeah, yeah. if you get pricked, it's obviously that you, you get strained out of the ceremony. So I'm walking down the street. I said, I said, what the hell what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's like this. He's staring at his finger. I said, this kid is out of his mind. He's yeah. a great kid, big earner. Right. He's a good kid, but these are the things that we go through. Yeah. You know? He wanted to let people know, basically. No, it was oh. him. He was just amazed that he got the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. They pricked it. I, you know, we pricked his finger, and, the, you know, that's yeah. it. Now he's in. Yeah. He couldn't believe it. He's staring at his finger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say half I said on the show. I don't want to be, you know, my yeah. mother might be watching well, this. Well, I want to say, you, came, you, came, you come from, the, I mean, the, it's all the real mafia, but the Genovese yeah. family is, uh, it's still well, it still ran still very into, well. Yeah. And, um... Do you do you have any like uh like look over your shoulder? Do you care? Like what's your situation? No, I know. my my concern now is just making money, right. legitimate money, and uh, living life, living good, which I'm right. doing. No well, concerns at all. You know, here's the thing. They know I was just. I'm saying my family, the Colombo family, don't exist. These guys yeah. are all wiped out. Your family's still the oh, mafia. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's so why like, they're there because they're they're. Uh, you know, they're more, the bosses are all insulated. Right. They're not uh, out doing, uh, th- th- you know, it is, they're an organized crime family. 
I mean, they, uh, they're still involved with unions and huge in construction and they're still got big in garbage. I mean, one of the bosses, he got indicted, his bail was 25 million and he posted it the same day, it was out the same day. I mean, that's nuts. And yeah. you know, they're all, all the bosses have money, big right. money. Um, and so the, you know, and they're smart, like you said about murder, who is gonna, who wants to put out a, uh, an order to go clip someone Especially today, another thing with technology, you want to talk about technology, how are you going to kill someone today? Yeah. I mean, wherever you go, there's cameras. I don't care if you go to a residential neighborhood, someone's got cameras on their house that's coming out, you got to leave the street, there's stores there, cameras are everywhere, they just go back, look at the car, the time, well, the this, the that. Well, let me, let me, so hard. Let, let me just start something for people, what you're saying. When you go do a piece of work, and whether it's me, Bobby, and Anthony talking about it, we need to get our guns. So we got to trust somebody to get our guns together. We need a car. So we got to tell one of our guys that steal cars to get us a car. So there's more exposure. Now you got to get a car without GPS. You got to make sure you're not going through any tolls. So if there's any photos taken. I put fake plates over. Lights have I used to get plates got, off yeah. cars and tape them on. Now you got street, <laughs> now you got street lights, that, that cameras. You got houses that cameras. The exposure is incredible. And then you got to be able to trust the, the group the of guys that were putting this yeah, thing together. Yeah, you track the phone. You know, your phone yeah, your phone. You track your phone, phone now. Anyway. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's uh, almost uh, an impossible thing to, to do at this point with and, technology. And that's why the mob was so good at all these years because, like we said, they summoned you to come somewhere. You come into the house. They blow your brains out. Got a hole somewhere, bury you, and you never see the body anymore. Chop you up, right. and that's how they get away with. It. That's the only way, really, you could get away with it. But see, I I couldn't come today. up with that like that. I ain't come up like that because we had a wall up there. Yeah, and we want to leave guys on the street. That's right. what we were doing. Right. Leave and them back on the then street. too, Bobby, it wasn't. It was in the nineties. It was so in the there 90s. wasn't as much technology as far as the cameras were everywhere. Oh, no, it was so know? easy. Yeah, we had guys Rob, in our crew robbing cars. I never wore a mask in my life. I said it. Yeah. Last I just, you know. We, you know, we had guys robbing cars. Who, who was getting us guns? Who was getting us this? These are all trusted guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? We were driving around with uh, shotguns and machine guns in our cars all night long looking for hey, people. I want to add yeah. uh, one more thing, too. Um, do you feel the downfall of your crew and everything was because Bruno died? Do you think that's what brought the heat and basically ruined everything for you guys? I think uh, what, what the downfall of our crew was is um, having... Uh, like I said, um, Artie in New York went from soldier to boss, and uh, he wasn't a good boss, and he brought that guy around him, JB, John Bologna. Oh, jeez. You know, and we got told by two different families He's the guy no was good. an informant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, as a boss, how do you have a guy, the boss of the Gambinos tells us, this guy, what do you got this guy around for? He's an informant. Then you got the Pat Rico from the, your family, the, the patriarch is over there, and uh, Beaver, I yeah. always forget his name, Beaver. He tells us that John is no good. The guy with the beard that comes up is no good. Now, this guy knows stuff that could put me in jail for the rest of my life. Right. So you tell me, is already a good boss by tell, having this guy that's not made involved in murders with us? That means, you know, you know, getting it's, involved yeah. in murder plots. And, uh, and then, you know, what was the big thing with Bruno? I mean, all jealousy, all uh, treachery to take Bruno down. I mean, yep. what was the guy really doing wrong? Obviously, he got killed because he talked to the FBI. Right. And okay? a lot of people thought that and anybody they blamed that's a gangster. You for that. you wasn't I can ask call. anybody here right. besides Felix, and Felix probably is learning, but you ask any street guy, any gangster, you, if you talk to the FBI and they, they show the 302, right. that the, uh, you're, you're talking to the, the right. FBI right. and you tell them how many made guys there are. Is the guy a made that's guy? Is, yeah, that's, are yeah. they going to kill you? Yes. yes. I mean, so sure that's why Bruno well, that's why I'm clearing up because they blamed you and you weren't the cause of it. Right. And that's why Bruno got killed. So the downfall, jail together, they don't know that. I would know have to stuff. say, yeah, right. absolutely. You know the story. Well, I know the story, so people don't know. That's why I'm trying to, you know. Right. And so the downfall would be a bad boss minority putting a real bad guy around us that destroyed. That's the downfall of our area, to sum it all up quick as I can. Right. Is that right there. How do you deal with someone that you are suspecting is an informant or is bad and you're kind of trying to tread lightly because you don't know what's... So, like, t you know, in our mice area, you don't have enough bullets to kill the informants. No. Okay, so in my area, <laughs> you have, like, a guy that just came out. He owns the biggest, um, he owns, he's been around the wise guys his whole life. He never got made, but he's been around them since, you know, the 70s, okay? And uh, it come out in public paper that he was an informant since the 80s. So 
the mob that if there was a why don't they kill this guy? But instead, they don't not kill him. They go to his place and spend money in his place instead. So, uh, but I could tell you if it was me back in the day, you know, I would have, um, you know, you would kill someone like that back in the day in that life. You have to. How do you not? If you're not a mobster, if you don't, you know, you're not, you're not in that life if you don't. You're not a boss if you don't. How do you, uh, how do you not um, kill the guy? So, I mean, if you know that the guy's an informant, any real guy in any real crew will, will deal with him and kill that guy. And, Let's see um, here. Y'all say here's a guy staying on the street, running his business. I had a few problems in Boston with the farms, obviously, you know, especially in the drug business. And a few of them I couldn't get at. And every time that happened, the way that I had things set up, I would just change up everything. Yeah. I'd move everything around. Right. You know, you got to remember now, they're a farmer's FBI. What happens if you clip in a farmer, they catch you doing that? You don't. Death, Death penalty. Death. Okay. Yeah. So we got to be smart on what we do, who we pick to kill, and what we're going to do. I knew a guy was a rat. I couldn't get my hands on him. He was gonna, it was going to be a problem if I clipped him or not. So I just changed things up. That's what I used to do. And I got away with all that for a while. Because I was expecting, you, you know, you got these earners on the street. They're not tough guys. They're bringing in two, 300000 a week. I got one guy, he's flipping 10 keys. You know, he's bringing, he's bringing all this money in every week for me, you know. He flipped on me. I couldn't get my hands on him, you know. But shame on me because I knew he wasn't strong. Yeah. Not that he'd be in a farmer, but right. I knew he wasn't strong. Yeah. Put him to in hold down 10, 20 keys, pinch, right, something like that. Yeah. Right. Well, it was. He got pinched over a key, Bo. We're oh, talking right. five years, this guy flipped. Ah, yeah. I didn't know he was that weak. Well, I, I didn't know I'd been true. around him. I think him. we all, and, you know, when you're in a drug business, they all, I had a guy, Guy Peden, same thing, making, you know, probably 50000 100000 himself a month. Work for me. I had the Pittman brothers, Galatis. Pittman brothers both died, Kevin and Dennis. Actually, his brother stays in touch with me. But we had safe house. Same thing. We would have to keep changing up because we had a feeling he was, he got pinched yeah. in Philly, actually, Atlantic City. They tried it. They raided the casinos. They thought I was going to be there. But later on, it becomes an informant. And uh, Galati never becomes a informant. He, he dies. A, a, actually, the brother kills him by accident. And it, the gun went off. And but there, all these guys are dead. But we had the safe house. We'd move around because of these guys. Seriously, serious guys that I did things yeah. with flipped on me, Bo. Yeah. These guys did time before. They were serious guys. Some of them made guys. They you flipped on me. You never know. You don't know no, who's going to be you anymore. Know. You don't know. No. Now you come home. Look at Joe Messino. Come on, man. Look, yeah, I, I know. I know. Look, you got, you got, I can name you names. People are like, come on, it's not even possible. But, you know, you don't it, know no it more. It happens. Right. It happens. We had a, a couple of weeks ago had Barry Levin on, a great attorney, actually. I've seen it. And, yeah, and, and we had a little insight on some of the things that go on. And, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, actually a good guy, very intelligent yeah. and the top attorney. So, you know, he, he has hundreds of stories of different cases. Obviously, he's involved in these cases. Yeah. It's amazing. It is. How good was the, the FBI and the feds back then at, at getting the mafia, would well, you, you say? You, you got to remember, you know, one of the biggest mistakes, I think, in the mob world, and every, you guys will, I think, will agree with me, is the, the routines is what kills us. So when you go into social clubs on a regular basis, the surveillance is very simple for the FBI. When you go into the same restaurants because we're comfortable, it's also an issue, same nightclubs, and we do it because of, not out of stupidity, out of being comfortable. Those are the locations yep. that our people have, and you know, we meet each other, and we, we, we seem to pick the same places because it's convenient. They're coming from Boston, we're coming from here, we'll meet somewhere that's you know, mutual, that we have a mutual friend or something, and that's a problem, an issue which makes it very easy for the FBI to surveil. So you have some good you know, work by the FBI, but you have some stupidity on our end. And also they were wrong. Back when we were running around, they had manpower. I mean, they had certain agents to, for each family, and a lot of them. I, yeah, I, I want to, you know, you know. So they had so many agents for the Bananos, for the Genovese, for the Gambinos, for the Patriarchas, and their focus number one was their number one priority in the United States was organized crime, and that's where all the agents focused. Then the right. 9/11 happened, yeah, terrorism and the terrorism. 
And now you know, like some some bananas on it don't have no agents even working on their family. Certain uh, Columbus you know, don't have a. Have and I a think team like anymore. they they went down to like two <laughs> agents yeah. per family. Yeah. And you know, compared to what they had before, you know, because so many agents now are working terrorism and uh, yeah, you know, it's the, different the, now. homeland security, and that became a big. Uh, you know, so you don't have a lot of uh, back then. They had so many different agents; they could focus on different crews and different. Well, I would ever. This is the biggest downfall. Yeah, that right also. They yeah. Could, yeah. But the phone could be right been. here, and they could still hear everything. You see, their technology they have, they oh, can hear yeah, to yeah, walls. Yeah, 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 you talk yeah, yeah. in a basement; they got machines that can hear you talking through the fucking wall. How are you supposed to beat them? You can't beat them no more nowadays. They want you. They they got you. That's it. Did they did they try to intimidate? I mean, were there some that you would keep seeing that they tried to intimidate you or use those kind of tactics ever? Oh yeah, yeah. One was the one that would make. How so? Yeah. No, I had a few restaurants, coffee shops. He come, he sit in front, make sure I would see him every day. I'm with a Roma up on the. I think I'm hiding up on row one. He walks through the door. <laughs> he sits to his back to the table just to break my balls. That's yeah. what they were doing. You know. But I didn't mind seeing them. It's when you don't see them you gotta worry about. Right. I don't mind seeing them. Well, when they present me, themselves, they, uh, that means you're getting locked up usually. Yeah, when yeah. they show themselves, that means they'll be the back to get you. That means the investigation's over. Yeah. They're coming to get you. Yeah. In 2003, they uh, put a listening device in my truck. I was driving in uh, an expedition, and uh, it just it happened to be that the day, the week that they put a listening device in my truck, I switched cars with my sister-in-law. And uh, it, it when did you them. find out that the- I never found out exactly? I just always talked like I had a bug in my truck, anyways. But for this particular reason, I got word that uh, they went to this um, uh, a Ford dealership and then were looking to try to uh, use one of their expeditions to see where oh, they could put a listening device where it worked. And somebody at the Ford place knew, uh, you know, worked there that knew someone that I knew. And how many guys were driving an expedition yeah. in my area that it's they like were the- looking to put a listening device? So I switched off, I switched with my sister-in-law and um, and I started driving her car. I never seen them follow me more blatantly when I did that. I mean, they were following me like right on my ass going here. You know, I was taking a left, left, left and going this way. And then I'd find them on another car following me over there. Then I get a message on my, um, on a phone. Uh, they left a voice message and my nickname was Bingy. And, uh, and they said, uh, come on, Bingy, uh, pick up your skirt. That Mitsubishi don't suit you. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who the fuck is this, right? <laughs> and, I, and I listen to it again, and I'm like, I go, that's the that's the the, the state police. I go, yeah. they're like, they're trying to abuse me to get out of that Mitsubishi, telling me it doesn't suit me. Yeah. To go back, to go you, back, go back, and, back and then the I get pulled gun. over by the state trooper. Uh, Murphy pulls me over. He was the head of the organized crime task force. He said, Aunt, what are you doing driving this car? I said, What's the problem with it, Murph? It's mm-hmm. my sister in law's car. I go, Well, you don't have two plates on. You don't have a front plate. That's why I'm pulling you over. I said, really, Murph? Okay. The I'll make sure I get that. Right? It's, it's like that Fear Sorry. City. It's like yeah. the Fear City, oh, I don't man. know, uh, where they talk about the bugs and the, the cars. And I mean, do you really, they really would tail you right behind you? I mean, No, they no. They suit. tailed me because they were trying they to get me to go back into my truck. But once they got, once I was back in my truck, like you said, you never see them. They yeah. listening to everything. They didn't get nothing on right. that tapes. Anyways, they got me they were putting subjects going to uh, Hartford, yeah. Morton Steakhouse, singing Frank Sinatra. You know, because you could fit eight people in the truck in the expedition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're singing Frank Sinatra, having a nice dinner, busting balls, smoking cigars. And that's pretty much what they heard in the truck. <laughs> Except when John come up, JB, yeah. he tried to talk in the car. Yeah, he was And like, I would just put the radio I up and whisper, you know, tell him not to, kid, to talk. That man. You know? You but get a lot funny. of banters back and forth with the FBI. We stayed, my friend Frankie, he still stays with me. We stayed at a hotel in, in uh, Florida. We're down in Tampa. That's where my case got based out of. And there's about five of us. We're going out to dinner. So we, we got uh, two suites, and one of the doors opens up to the pool. So we try to come back. We forget something. We go back to the room, and we can't get in. And I'm like, what? how can we not be getting in? We're playing with the door. We call security. They come in. And I said, ah, you know what? Go around the back, Frankie. I said, and go in through the back. So he goes through the back. The back door is open. And they put the, the, not the chain, that bar that goes across. And they were putting, they were wiring up the room. And we just got lucky because, not that we got lucky because we all got pinched. But, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we got lucky. We stumbled on and we knew they were in the room. And they ran out the back, left the door open, actually. And the bar was there. So it's impossible to bother. We just walked out the room. 
so that we knew they were in a room wiring it up. And then we kind of strong armed the manager because he was petrified. We told him, yeah, we, you know, I can't talk to you. They'll they'll yeah. lock me up. And we said, you're going to get locked up or you're going to get killed. Which one you rather have? <laughs> yeah. He says, all right. Well, the FBI well. was here. <laughs> so, you know. We they were doing that to me <laughs> everywhere I went. Hey, nowadays, technology is so advanced. They could watch you from satellite if they really want you. If oh, you're a yeah. boss like that and they really want you following around, they'll watch you from the sky. Right. You know what I mean? They have technology today you just can't beat. Well, right. the last year was all open surveillance. I used to leave from Boston and go to Philly like once a month. And I used to stay at uh, near Park Arav, near the Veteran Stadium, right. in that hotel there. Every time I come down in the morning, there's a Massachusetts State Police. They had the hat in the back. They weren't hiding. Right. They just, you know, I never actually seen them. I think I bumped into them in the elevator. And every time I was in Philly, it was always open surveillance. I come out of a, a joint down there, and I'm on camera. I used to wave at them, walk away. That didn't bother me. I was used to it. I know they were following me. I know that, you know, what was going on. Me, I was always clean, you know. I wasn't too worried about it. But it's like I said, when you don't see them, that's that's what I'm worried about. Yeah, well, yeah. it's too quiet. But they told me when they got me. They never got me on a wire. They never got me in the house. They never got me in every place we had bug, Because we never talked. It was always this, mm. this, yeah. this. Yeah. We never talked. Right. And it was the same conversation. You didn't have signs on your walls? I, I, I've been in social clubs where they said, do not talk about crimes in here. You're being recorded. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but everything with us was you took care of that thing. Did you go see that guy? Did he give you that thing? Everything hey, you know what's funny thing. about that? And that's you, what we did all the time. Right. If you watch Analyze This or Analyze That, yeah. Robert De Niro was actually hilarious in that. Yeah. He said, did you take care of that thing? He goes, what thing? The first thing or the second thing? <laughs> I don't remember what the first thing was. You know, it was actually funny band. Yeah. yeah, that's and I would change up conversation on the guys they would get lost when I started talking you know but that's what it was Yeah, you right. saw that guy right did yeah. he give you the thing right. they don't know what the thing is <laughs> yeah, yeah. is he getting money drugs a gun they don't know what yeah. the thing is so they were always listening and then when I was dealing with the Colombians and some of my guys we had the beepers yeah I had codes yeah. they used to write out yeah. Yeah, and we only did. two or yeah. three guys had the it codes, yeah. Yeah. and that was it they didn't know Yeah, they didn't know what to do once a month you change that up so how do the codes work for people listening out there that... Well, you can do it simply. I mean, yeah, it's, we, it's we like met on the club on 98th Street. We just put in 98. Right? Yeah. So you go into... The, yeah. We know we got to be at the club. And 911, you know that something's going on. Bring right. a pistol with you. Yeah. So, you know, this, that, you know that's a simple way to do it. But the there's other codes. You have a spot. You, oh, meet, you just punch in it. You, you know you're yeah. going to meet at this spot. Say you have three spots. One, two, and three. Yeah, right. And then you punch in one... They know that's spot number one at 10.30. Yeah. I gave you the simple version, exactly. There's yeah. a lot of things. We put all ones in. Yeah, That'd be ones, one yeah. location, you know. So, you know, we had... And then when we were wrapping keys up, we put area codes where they were going. Yeah, so yeah, we knew, yeah. oh, please, forget about it. We used to do. Too funny. Now, ultimately, um, you know, part of the show, obviously, is to, to influence kids to make sure to stay out of that life because we talk about so many different aspects that are so treacherous. Um for those kids out there that are, you know, maybe at risk of falling into a life of crime or born into it, um, families in there or just don't have money and whatever, what's the best piece of advice that each of you three can can give um, that kid out there who's, you know, tempted by the money and all that uh, and ultimately... To I would say to them that the struggle is better. It's a better life. Wow. You know, I don't want to say, I don't want to be corny, but, you know... If you could go to work every day, put your head at the pillow at night, and raise your kids, you're a good man. When you look for that easy money, a lot of bad things are going to come with it. You know, we live in a world with good and evil. We were all advocates for Satan at one time. Right. Look at the things that we did in our lives, you know? How do you feel about yourself now? Do you feel better about yourself? Absolutely. You feel you're out there, you're helping people. We got up every day, we didn't know who we had to hurt or if we were going to get hurt. You know, these young kids don't realize that they watch these movies, these kids. I don't care if you're black, white, brown. I don't care what you are. You know, best thing to do. And I don't care if you got to go work at McDonald's for $12 an hour. You're better off doing that than getting involved in the street. Because there's nothing good coming out of that. Paul, you know? I'd say the educational system's a lot better nowadays than when we went to school. There's a lot more opportunities for people to go to school and get higher paying jobs and stuff like that. My advice would be go to school route, you know, get yourself more education, pick out something you like. There's careers out there that are paying big money and you work's are. minimal. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to kill yourself for a week's pay anymore. There are a lot of good jobs out there now. Better off, just go to work. 
you know? And I would say, like Polly said, um, education. Mm -hmm. Pick a field, a legitimate business field, and just educate yourself on that field. Become the best at it and just um, concentrate on that. One, whatever that field is, whether it's uh, the garb uh, garbage business, you know, putting dumpsters everywhere, learn about the business, learn everything you can, even education in general. Just educate yourself and uh, pick something and just concentrate on it and be the best at it. And you would That's make a hundred yeah. times more than you would on the streets. In the be laundry. proud of what you do. These guys in the neighborhood, they sweep streets. They work for the city all their lives. They got pensions, they got insurance, they got homes. Right. And definitely don't join any You uh, have to respect everybody and what everybody and does. don't kill or uh, violence. On a lot of these shows, I don't know if you guys hear me talking about, and it's important, everything they're saying, here's the thing the kids miss, that we all know from all the joints we were in, all of us. They don't want to work at McDonald's on the street, but you'll go to jail and clean toilets. You'll go fucking for seven sweet. cents a day. <laughs> so I'll do someone's laundry. I work for two dollars a week. I used to get in the state. Two yeah. seven dollars a week. Every, that's what I got. Do yeah. something positive out here, so you don't got to do that in there. And then you know, education. Listen, I always talk about education. Second thing is, if you're not sure and you're on the ropes, follow a kid. Just recently, I put up on my Instagram, Derek. You see him with me on some of the shoots. Uh, he's a black kid. Comes from, lived homeless for a while. His mom yeah. got killed and uh, was murdered. And he had a re real rough life. And he went through some things and he put a tape up. Go relate to somebody like that. If you can't relate to me or him or him, find somebody you can relate to and then follow what he's doing. That mind strength not to get into the street because the street's a dead end. You're going to end up like all of us or dead. Yeah. So, you know, you, you got to fo follow somebody besides the education and then understand if you don't want to work you're going to go to jail and work it's not like years ago you could stay in your rack if you do that now they put you in a hole so you know you're going to go to work in jail does that yeah. make any sense work of a seven cents when you can work somewhere else and get a job yep you know beautiful i went to you know listen i still have money coming in every month my family took care of me but i still worked in prison yeah and oh, i yeah. was proud to do it buffing yeah. floors you know, head well, coach, well, it even passes time for you too. It right. does. It's mentally. That's yeah. why I yeah. did it. I couldn't right. take being but staggered. But pay no is more. is I nothing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about that, yeah. but it's just taking right. pride in yourself and doing right. something. You know, because you learn. You got to learn the hard way sometimes. You know, we we were undisciplined. Let's say the truth. Mm -hmm. Oh, we know our business. We know our business. What we had to do. But basically, we were undisciplined. You know, get that discipline in you. I feel bad because I, I watch now what's happening with this Black Life Matters nonsense. You know, the blacks are great people in this country. They're in politics. They're in the military. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're everything, these people. They're a big part of this country. And yeah, it's sad. Some of us, even white, all different nationalities and ethnicities. You know, we grew up in a gutter. What are we going to do? We want to fight our way out. But how do you fight your way out of this? You go to work. You do the best you can. You understand? We all wanted the fast way. And look what the fast way brought us. But I'm going to tell you something, because, and we try to stay off politics here, but I'll tell you one thing. You try getting a million man march with, with white guys, Yeah. you get 10 people show up. That's the right. Black community, actually, they, these guys, and I'm friends with a lot of guys, and I say it every show. You get a million people like it's this. They stick together. And, they and, do. And, 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 They're and a great the thing people. is, they are 100 percent yeah they have something in a strength that i think a lot of times people lost that their way of banding together that's why i'm always talking about unity and i talk about these kids that if you're smart enough and you work hard enough you can do anything you want it doesn't have to be uh li like we ended up it doesn't have to be because we didn't have structure that's why i talk about armed forces you go to jail you know you, you get structure yeah. If, if you go to the armed forces, you get structured in a positive way. That's right. But we just, uh, uh, you know, guys that didn't want to follow a good path, man. And yeah. There's no answer for it besides uh, doing the right thing with your life, and that's with structure and hard work. Yeah, you know? that's what they need. Education. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, taking the time today. Well, Polly, Bobby, Anthony, uh, pleasure thank to have you. you guys on the show. Yeah. I can speak for these two. And uh, is there, go ahead, plug away, anything we got to plug away? Well, again, I want to plug away KCL Automotive. If you need a car, if you need work done, if you need uh, stickers, if you need tires. My cousin's uh, there at 98th Street. 
98 Henry Street, uh, East Stroudsburg, PA. Anybody needs to get in touch with them. The number is, can you read that? 570-534-8497. You can reach me at John Elite officially or uh, johnelite.com website. And you guys, tell us if you have books. I think you got some books and yeah. stuff out. And I wanted different to just things. mention, I just yeah. have an author, a uh, guy that was uh, a local guy I knew, the family my whole life, uh, Joe Bradley. He's written six novels, and um, they uh, he's got six novels that he's written now, and he's just started our process of our book. Um, excellent author, excellent books. I mean, I read one book, Ticket to Paradise, in one day. Great book. And he, we also have some uh, screenplays on one of his books that we're trying to push into the uh, into a movie. That's one of the projects we're working on. But excellent author, uh, Joel Bradley. Can and we he's, all play in it? Oh, Absolutely. Right. Right. So, you have an Instagram. You're going to have to come and shop with this guy, boy. Yeah, right, take care of right, everything. Right. <laughs> yeah, Instagram is my name, Anthony Arolata. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. Check that out. Bobby, plug away. I'm in about a half a dozen books. <laughs> and uh, the last book I was in was uh, Ghost by uh, Ralph Azulo. He's an author from New York. He's in California now. And uh, the book that he just wrote, Ghost, uh, Sylvester uh, Stallone's production company picked it up. Oh, really? Oh, they're good. either going to do a Netflix thing or a movie with that. Oh. And it's nice because I'll be a big character in that book. You know, wow. that's the FBI agent that got me. Wow. So I got in touch with Ralph, and uh, he's starting my book right now. Okay. He's got a proposal ready for it. You know, but with the COVID and everything that's going on, right, same situation. you know, we don't know when this is going to come out. But that's what we're working on right now. And I was also talking to Anthony and Pauly of maybe doing some type of podcast up in Boston. Well, we'd love for you to do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, so I got some connections up there. I just want to see if I can get this thing together for us. You know, it's just nice to come on and talk. I was doing some things because I was a pastor for a little while, you know, and I got the... Uh, uh, Facebook page under Alonzo Esposito. I'm sorry, YouTube channel. Is that what they call it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm still not. How, do we get how, do, how does people get in touch with you? Can they get in touch with us? get in touch with us through us? Well, all the shows I do. you did. have an Instagram? Huh? Yeah, I got Instagram. <laughs> Bobby Luisi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what was I got? What did you ask me, Johnny? Well, I'm How can people get in touch now? Look at this. Get about 10 scotches. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. How did I walk out of there? I don't know. How can people get in touch with you? <laughs> A lot of people find me on Facebook. Okay. okay. Robert Alonzo Luisi. They find me on that way. That's how I did a few of my shows. Oh, you know, I, I have a book right now on Amazon, The Last Generation by Alonzo Esposito. It's a Christian book. I break down from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelations. Mm. I wanted it to be an easy read. It's a summary of my teachings that I used to do. You know, because uh, why I was in there, I got a degree in theology. Wow. Really? Yeah, I did. I wanted to really, you know, I really pushed into that. You know, unfortunately, when I came home and I started to get into the church and the pastoring and the TV, uh, it ate up a lot of my money. Yeah. It's really hard to get into the ministry part of it, you know, yeah. but I really enjoyed that, yeah. you know. So, uh, Polly, any, any social media plugs? Um, no, but I'd like to get back in touch with our people from Harvard University and see if they want to do a follow-up documentary you on did me a, to see where I am now. You did, what, what was the, will you tell people what exactly you did with Harvard? Um, it started off as a six-month study, three months, the last three months you're locked up and three months when you come home and they just found out like that they really enjoyed being around and seeing the way I was and uh, turned into a two-year study, wow. turned into a documentary and um, it was by Natalie Smith and it's called A Walk Through the Jungle and it's with uh, me and two other men, um, different ethnicities and ages and stuff like that and the struggles we come through when we're first coming home and then after we're home. And um, it, it was really amazing. Uh, it was shown worldwide, actually. Last time I heard, they were showing it in Australia. Remind um, us the title of it? Um, a Walk Through the Jungle. A Walk and, uh, Through the Jungle. It was Natalie Smith. Natalie was, Smith. Um, yes, it was her Beautiful. baby. <laughs> People check that out. Um, Gene? Oh, my. Uh, I'll let you, uh, you, uh, you contact me at my Instagram, GeneBoy666. And um, also, I have a book in the works. It's going to be the first modern-day mafia book, and it's due out within six months. Nice. Isn't yeah. your author coming on with us soon? Sure. Yeah, uh, who helped me with the book, Lou Romano. I also have to give a shout-out to the guy who helped me write it, 
I was in jail with him, Teddy DiBatoro. Oh, yeah. Oh, me and you, good friends with him. He blew up the chicken He killed, man. Philly tested a chicken man. This is real, I know. He's actually really smart, and he's actually a waiter when he was killing people for the mob. I know it's... He won a case for me, too. Yes, he won a case for... This guy was great. used to be, though. Huh? Yeah. Waiters, yeah. right? Yeah, Shoemakers, he was a waiter. Farmers. He killed yeah. the mob boss with a nail bomb. This is a real story. Um, yeah. He helped me write my book. Um, he sat with me every day. Uh, for uh, a couple hours a day for about a year, we did it, and now Lou Romano, who's coming on, and he helped me fix it up a little bit, and it'll be out soon. Lou Romano will be on the show soon. Too awesome, beautiful, and people can follow me on Instagram at Felix Levine, and uh, people listening out there, again, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and the Patreon channel, which is our new platform. Uh, we'll be releasing all our episodes early on there. Uh, it's so much better than anything we've used in the past. Um, you can be able to stream every show for the Johnny and Gene show on your phone, tablet, TV. Uh, they have a fantastic app. It's really the number one uh, app for creators. So make sure you subscribe there. And uh, well, we, We're going to put the extra content in there, right? Everything's up there. So we'll show when we make Felix on that. And that <laughs> gonna be an honor, when number. they straighten me out. <laughs> you want me to do it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's going to walk around with the finger like yeah, this. Yeah, I want to see Oh, my God, they did it. We got a couple of bosses in the house, so they can do it. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, thank uh, yeah, you so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. That's so funny. Thank you. That, that was good, guys. Yeah. Perfect.